Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, can we uh, can I welcome everyone to the 17th meeting in 2012 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. If you've not already done so, can I remind everybody to turn off their mobile phones and Blackberries because they do affect the broadcasting system. Um, we begin the meeting today with our second evidence session on the affordable housing spending allocation within the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2013-14. So today can I welcome the witnesses who are David Bookbinder, Head of Policy and Public Affairs, the Chartered Institute of Housing in Scotland. Fraser Stewart, the lead member of Housing Investment of Glasgow and West Scotland Forum of Housing Associations, also the director of New Gorbals Housing Association, and Gordon McRae, head of communications and policy with Shelter Scotland. Can I thank you all for uh, the written evidence which you've <coughs> given us? And Margaret, would you like to start the questioning today, please? Good morning. Can I ask you what your views of the government's overall ambition for Scotland to become a hydro nation? Yeah. Um, wrong question, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise, I apologise. I'm, so, I'm, just so I'm just so keen on the Scottish water. Sorry. Um, the government's five-year plan to develop 30,000 additional affordable homes, um, i.e. 6,000 per year, resulted in 6,800 completions in year one. Um, why did the performance exceed the targets and what are your views about whether the target for the rest of the planning period can be met? Anybody? Could I maybe start? Um, the quick answer to why the first year's performance exceeded the target is, is that the completions uh, that it was based on were, were, were generally funded through a more generous grant regime. The, the litmus test of, of whether the, the forward programme is going to be successful or not is, is what's being approved. Um, the, the, the approvals uh, uh, in 2011-12 were just over 6,000, of which about 60% were, were social rented. Uh, it, it, it was, it was, some saw it as quite a cynical move that the uh, Scottish Government uh, uh, switched from counting approvals as, as, as the programme to, to completions. Uh, I think approvals are, are really give you the, 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 the true picture of what's being funded from, from here on in. Else? Yeah, well, I think it's important that we compare the two, the previous spending review with this spending review. Um, there has, there is an, there are an issue with the, the level of transparency about the, the, the funds that are available. So it's easier to look at the 770 million pounds that's been allocated during this three-year period compared to the nearly 1.4 billion pounds of the previous three-year period. Um, as David rightly says, part of the reason for the completions being up. Uh, in previous years is because of a couple of things like accelerated uh, finance that was brought in during the, the, the lowest point of the, the recession. But what we expect is that during this three-year period, uh, that the target of what would be 18,000, because the 30,000 is over the period of the Parliament, not over the period of the, the spending review. So 18,000 affordable homes, of which about 12,000 would be social rent during those three years. Um, the only way that can be delivered is at considerably lower levels of, of grant uh, subsidy. Um, we have to assume, therefore, that we're looking at around about 40 to 45,000 pounds per, per unit. Um, that's never been delivered before on a sustained level. And our real concern is that we're looking effectively at a 45 per cent cut in the overall capital budget for house building between the, this, this comprehensive spending review period and the previous one. And a real worry is that with welfare reform also kicking in during this period, we're facing a real kind of one-two knockout punch for low-income families who desperately require secure, affordable housing. It's going to be more difficult to access secure, affordable housing because we have to anticipate, and looking at the starts, we have to anticipate there's going to be fewer social rented properties available in the next three, four years. The part of the question I'd like to answer is whether um, we're going to achieve the figures for, for the remainder of the period rather than comment on uh, why, there were, why the 6,000 figure was exceeded. Um, our, our concern, uh, the Glasgow Mrs. Scotland Forum's concern, is that um, 
the, the, the costs or, or the level of grants are just not sufficient to sustain uh, the, the level of development that the, the government's looking to be uh, to be achieved. Um, and even even if we include things like market rent and mid market rent and so forth, as far as we can see, that the, the 70 30 split in the programme, 70 per cent socially rented, 30 per cent mid market rent, and, and other forms of low cost home ownership, uh, is much more, the outturn is much more likely to be 30 per cent social rent and 70 per cent uh, mid market. That's certainly my own association's experience, and we're being as flexible as we can in order to maintain momentum and regeneration programmes. And that's the anecdotal evidence uh, across the local authorities, including Glasgow, uh, although that, that remains to be seen. The, the government officials haven't actually laid out any planning assumptions with regard to how um, these figures will be achieved, and they seem to be relying on other organisations, like I think, I think it's CIH or it might be Shelter, uh, to say that the figures will be achieved. It's disappointing that they haven't put in the planning assumptions. Another thing that features in this is that rents appear to have gone up significantly as a result of the IIF fund. Um, we've, there is evidence that there's some rents are indeed in excess of mid-market rents. There are social rents which are above £5,000 a year have had to be implemented to achieve the figures that you just mentioned. Uh, that, in our view, is not sustainable and I don't think housing associations across Scotland would be happy to apply rent levels which we're seeing in the last year to future years. So I think there's a huge question mark with regard to whether uh, it's achievable. And I think that what government officials have to do is properly review and examine what was achieved through IIF because things haven't changed significantly. Uh, and they have to plan properly with regard to, or sorry, actually publish their assumptions with regard to what the shape of the programme is going to be, because uh, we are certainly not convinced that it's deliverable, especially, as has been said, on the social housing num uh, unit numbers. I think it's important to say that the original government ambition was for all of these units to be social housing, and now it's only 70%, but I don't think that's, you, there's every possibility that that won't be achieved. Thank you. Um, I mean, you've answered part of the question as well um, about the shortfall. What should or do you think could be done to alleviate the deficit in affordable new supply? I think at Shelter Scotland, we would certainly argue that um, we should look at reversing the 45% the cut. I think it's important to recognise, yes, the capital budgets have been reduced overall in the Scottish uh, block grant. Mm -hmm. But the overall capital cut is about 33%. Housing is taking a 45% a share of, uh, of those cuts. We think that's disproportionate. And long term, uh, you know, with the, we are in the midst of a, a real and deep social, social housing crisis in Scotland. Long term, these cuts will exacerbate the problems that people face being able to access affordable, secure accommodation. And we would rather that the choices that were made within the capital budget between what we've seen is transport has had some additional funds. Um, even with the recent £40 million pounds added into the, the affordable housing budget, that just takes a, what was a 50% cut to 45%. It's still disproportionately large compared to the, the overall capital budget, and we would hope that the Scottish Government would reconsider bringing housing more into line with the, 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 the mainstream cut that capital was taking. Mm -hmm. Certainly, any, any, any additional money that, that comes along, even within a spending period, and, and, and we have seen some of that, which, which, which helps make up for the, for the, for the, for the uh, huge, huge uh, reduction that, that, that Gordon was, was referring to. Um, anything that, any new money that can come along during the, during the spending review is obviously really, really welcome. The, the cautionary note, I suppose, we'd put on um, playing the numbers game is, is, is that it, it, it's going to be hugely important to... Uh, monitor what's being provided and where, not just the actual number of units, because there's a real fear that as, as things get squeezed even more, um, anything that costs a bit more, or in some cases significantly more, simply gets squeezed. So remote, remote rural, you know, working on remote rural sites, um, uh, working on possibly contaminated brownfield sites as part of an urban regeneration scheme, um, building housing to full wheelchair standard, building housing to greener standards, all these things cost more, and there's, a, there's, there's an obvious risk that they'll get unduly squeezed, disproportionately squeezed, uh, when funding gets tight. So we've got to make sure that a range of needs uh, is being met and not just that, 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 that we can tick the numbers box. I think that 
what's happened in the last two or three years is that they're, you're, they're squeezing the pips until they squeak, and they've squeaked, but nobody's listening. Um, and that what is actually needed is additional funding. It is actually as simple as that. So something like what Gordon was saying, that you know the the the, the cuts to housing, which there have to be being restored to the sort of you know the, the, the national average for, for for other things that government fund would go a long way, I think, to resolving the issue. But to get, you know, to bring a sort of individual housing association perspective to it, my own housing association three or four years ago was having to raise private finance of around £35,000 for each unit, social rented housing unit be built. That then moved on to £55,000, at which point, um, you know, the pips were squeaking um, and we wouldn't have been able to sustain that. Now, if we were to go ahead with um, new builds, we'd have to find £85,000 per unit to do social rented housing. That is not sustainable. We will not do it. Now, we are looking to try to maintain momentum in um, <coughs> transformational regeneration projects, so we will look at doing very um, modest numbers of social rent, which we can afford, and we will look at doing it some mid-market rent, but we can't look at developing to any great degree or to any scale. And I think uh, perhaps you'll be going on to ask, ask questions about later on, to, to look in, in areas like Glasgow, where there's no local authority house building, uh, for larger housing associations to undertake that, I think would be a very, very dangerous path to go down. Could I, could I um, <coughs> focus very heavily on uh, the reduction in, in spending and also the, the level of the, the grant cut per unit. Um, is is uh, clearly that the Scottish Government are saying yes, has been, we've had to reduce the, the grant per unit of housing, uh, but there is evidence to suggest that we will still be able to uh, maintain the level of uh, uh, new, new housing supplied. Is there not an element of that as uh, there's a change in balance expected between the provision by um, RSLs and provision by local authorities, and is, uh, is there not an implicit challenge to local authorities to step up to the plate in terms of the provision of, of social housing? I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that um, there are always efficiencies which can be brought out of any sector. Uh, what we would argue is that housing associations and, and local authorities have done that, uh, and we've actually seen over the last few years more delivered with less. I think what disappoints us is that rather than saying, well, that is a case for putting more in because we will get, we will get closer to actually starting to address housing need, I think it's important to recognise none of these plans, and I think the Scottish Government wouldn't, wouldn't suggest that otherwise, none of these plans are about addressing housing need at that scale. This is about maintaining momentum within the, the, the social sector. Um, but I think the real test is starts. So we're looking at the number of new starts last year over, you know, across the social sector, local authority and housing association, and it's fair to say there has been a, a, you know, a, a, an increase in 10, 11 in local authority starts, but the overall starts have gone from um, 4,800 in 10, 11 to 3,366 in 11, 12. Now, given the lag time that comes in from that, that would suggest that we are facing a, something of a cliff edge when it comes to new completions in, in the next few years. I think it's about Look, looking in, into the future. At the moment, there, there is evidence, uh, as Gordon has alluded to, that in some areas there is capacity within, within the local authorities. And I think you heard that from Alacho a couple of weeks ago, that there is uh, capacity to increase uh, how much they're building. And in some areas, that may well make up for the shortfall that we'll see in the coming years from, from housing associations. That will vary, though, from area to area, and I think the big question is what happens in areas where the council uh, either isn't building at all or, or is, is coming towards the end of its uh, capacity, which is, is the case in, in, in some council areas, and in that, in that instance, then we may, we may see a real problem, uh, it, it, and possibly in, in areas like Glasgow where there is no house building programme, um, uh, not in the next year or two, but thereafter. I think if we could just add to that, I think um, if that's the expectation, that should have been modelled by officials. Those planning assumptions should have been published. Can I ask um, why you um, go for um, calculating the number on approvals rather than completions? I mean, others have said that it should be on completions rather than approvals. 
I mean, it, it, ultimately, if you move from a system, first of all, if you move from a system uh, of counting approvals and then, and then overnight you start counting completions, you're counting the same house twice for about a year or two's worth of, of house building. But okay, even if you accept uh, that you start with a clean sheet and start with completions, it, 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 it feels a bit rich for the government to cut grant rates and then say, but look, we've, we've, we've supplied 6,800 homes when they were funded on a more generous grant rate. So we're just looking for a kind of an honesty, if you like, uh, 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 about, about you know, saying with the lower grant regime, this is what's been funded. And the only way of doing that is, is, is counting approvals. That gives you a sense of where the programme is going sort of from the present onwards, not, not about what was funded on different grant levels two years ago. Ultimately, if, if we're moving towards completions, then in time, we will, get, we will get a clearer picture of what's being funded on the lower grant regime. But we don't have that picture just now. Okay. And the other question I have on this is, um, you know, the construction industry sees it's in dire straits. Um, obviously, there are, there's going to be lots of competition to build the houses from the construction companies, and the cost is going down. Can you give us some idea of what the cost of building a house, say, this year is compared to two or three years ago? There's no evidence that costs are continuing to go down. We've, we've reached rock bottom as a rule. Um, in fact, in some cases, there's evidence that some costs are, are going up um, because you've got a situation where there's been so many layoffs and, and uh, redundancies and firms going out of business that you, you, you've now got a different sector competing. Costs are still, don't get me wrong, still very keen, but a brick costs what a brick costs. And I think that, you know, just through ordinary competition, we're, we're getting very good prices. I don't think anybody um, should rely upon costs going down further, but there's other organisations who, who will be more competent to, to answer, like Homes, Homes for Scotland, for example, as to whether or not costs can do, go down further. My, my view is we are not planning for costs to go down further, and they have, they have remained flat for the last year and a half or so. I would defer to, to the, the house building. Experts, um, from our perspective, just to go back to the, the completions point, we think there's actually a logical case for using completions as the, as the standard. But as David really says, the, we're in the interim period just now where we're double counting some, some houses. If the question in front of us is what will the money allocated in the comprehensive spending review and in this financial year deliver, then I think we can only conclude it's going to deliver less than, than it was previously uh, anticipated in the, the previous three year period. Can we move on? Malcolm. I was going to ask you... Uh, about the 6,000, which to a large extent you've covered, although I'm, I mean, I will ask you one question about that in a moment, but a sort of prior question is really about transparency. I think what you've said has been very helpful in helping us to try and understand that at the moment, particularly what you've said about completions as against uh, approvals. But I suppose one of the problems about the um, draft budget is that... The, well, it appears not to me to be not very transparent, but I suppose part of the problem is we've had these extra sums of money announced over the last few months, which are, as far as I can see, nowhere um, stated in the document. So I, I just wonder what you think about transparency, how it could be improved. And I suppose my final point is I would like to thank, um, certainly I've heard from both Shelter and the Chartered Institute and read the evidence. You, you seem to you seem to be more on top of it than I am, so if you, if you could explain how you've arrived at your figure of 770 million as distinct from, I think, 630 million that was announced uh, in the budget process last year, that would probably be helpful just in the interests of uh, helping us to understand uh, what all these figures amount to. As far as I know, there's been three extra announcements since the budget was announced a year ago, three extra sums of money, and then there was Nicola Sturgeon's speech on Sunday, which I take to be a re-announcement, but people may be able to shed some light on that. I'll, I'll kick off and go, 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 go and make, may come in. I think the, the, my, uh, by my calculations, the 140 additionally in the last uh, effective year and a half since the, since the original draft budget for the three-year period has, has come in three tranches. And you're right, the last one was in, was in September. And I think yet the, the announcement earlier this week was confirmation of, of, where, of, of that new uh, 40 or 45 million. Um, most of the, the additional 100, well, a large tranche of the additional 140 uh, uh, CIH understands has come from Barnet consequentials from, from spending announcements uh, down, down south. That's still welcome. I mean, um, we would expect Bar Barnet consequentials 
from housing announcements down south to be respected in terms of coming to housing because cuts are very quickly, Westminster cuts are very quickly passed on, so we would expect uh, Westminster spending uh, to, to, to be reflected in, in additional money uh, up here. But yes, uh, 140 million extra in, in, three, in three different tranches. I think the, the largest tranche was somewhere around 80, 85 million, which came as, as Barnet consequentials, but Gordon may have the up to date figures in front of you. Is Stephen see anything on the original announcements, which would make that clear? Um, I, th I think the overall point um, that is is very frustrating, being you know housing policy people trying to get in behind the the, the announcements. Uh, there is, we only got level four data uh, in the last few days for the, for the most recent announcements. Um, there is a lack of transparency about where this money is going, and that's why I say we have to compare comprehensive spending review periods against each other rather than the, the kind of ups and downs in one or two years. The most recent announcement just the, at the weekend was how the money was going to be allocated rather than the announcement of an entirely new money. Um, that was previously identified and I understand that was a Barnet consequential. Um, but I would share David's analysis. It is predominantly money that has come from uh, announcements down south. I think the Scottish Government should be commended for ensuring that that money goes into housing. Uh, I think it is worth noting that there is broad political consensus now that social and, and affordable housing is an important area to draw attention to. Um, I just think we need to, we need, we're yet to get the kind of game-changing announcement that will actually get us to, to a position where we start to address housing need um, rather than a, a number of small initiatives at various points throughout the year. Okay. If I could just add that. They are the experts on, on those overall figures on a national basis, but in relation to your point in transparency, something that might be easily missed is that um, grant is no longer payable throughout projects, it's payable only in completion, which is another way of buying a year for free, which means that we're going to have to go through several years before we can start comparing you know, figures on a light-for-light -light basis. And I'd also point out that not paying grant until, until completion is the most inefficient use of public money. The best use of public money is to put the money in as early as possible and up front because it is requiring of housing RSLs like ourselves to borrow, to develop, which is costing in the region of £3,000 per unit. If the money is going in up front, that cost, which is effectively a public purse cost at the end of the day, uh, would not be encountered. So there is there's a loss of £3,000 per unit in development funding as a result of the switch to payment on completion. It's another sleight of hand, shall we say, that not many people would necessarily pick up. The, the, the subsidy isn't £42,000 a unit, it's between 39 and 40. I mean, it, it would be interesting, I mean, just before I go into my 6000 a year question, it, you know, just in terms of transparency, I mean, given that we've had those three announcements of extra money and you're saying it's paid on completion, it's, it's not quite clear to me, you know, just to take the latest, latest example, what that 40 million will actually, how it will be spent, particularly if it's to be spent this year. But it, that, that's, really, that's really just a, a completion of the transparency point. But I suppose my more substantive point is, question is, you, you've, you've expressed all of you some scepticism about the 6,000 unit target. So I suppose the question really is, what feasible alternative measures would you ask the government to consider in order to help meet the target? Now, obviously, some of you, if not all of you, have already expressed the, the simple demand of, of, more, of, more, um, of more money, but I just wonder if there are any other suggestions you would have, and I suppose equally, even if you do propose extra money, how would you like it to be spent? I, I guess Fraser Stewart would like to, something to be done about the, the, the subsidy level for, the, uh, for each well, house, but any other suggestions uh, from all of you would be useful. Um, I, think, I think we are getting to a point where we have to acknowledge that there are no real alternatives to direct subsidy to deliver the, the, the social housing that we require. And I think if the, if the only game in town was get 6,000 units up, then we'd be better off looking at a, a new town somewhere and, and just build it. Um, what we, and I think what's important to remember is when we talk about social rented properties, we're talking about properties with security of tenure, we're talking about um, a, a level of affordability that's not, not found in the private rent, rented sector um, or in mid-market rents, although I think there is some evidence of, of what we would have identified as a social house in the past, now having its rent increasing to those kind of levels. We would like to see investment 
made available to house building, be it council or housing association, um, to build their good quality homes in the places that they need to be based on an analysis of, of need. And one of the things we have called for is that um, the Scottish Government should undertake an overall look at the national picture for housing needs. Because what we have just now are, an, are some very useful tools for local authorities to identify need in their area, but they don't always take into account the cross-border issues. So Edinburgh's analysis and East Lothian's analysis may well conflict in some areas. What we need is a national picture, because the last best estimate of housing need um, was done by uh, Professor Bramley. Um, our analysis of that shows that it required, he was suggesting we need about 10,000 new social rented properties a year just to meet the levels of demand due to demographic changes and various things. The 6,000, which was the only political party to put a target on the house building in the, at the last election, 6,000 target was welcome, but it is about maintaining some life in the house building sector. It is not about addressing need. We want to see a house building programme that starts to address the the issues of poverty, ill health, low education attainment, these are the consequences of poor housing. Um, and we, we certainly think that the choices that the Scottish Government can make between expensive transport projects and vital housing projects, um, you would expect us to say this, but we would expect we would prefer that money is put into housing over those other projects. Yeah, I, th I think um, there is, as God says, there is no magic answer, but I think the sector deserves credit for for doing its best uh, in the last year or two to try and look at things differently. For example, where um, housing associations, in, in conjunction with their strategic uh, local authority partners, do see in some hotspot areas a real market for, for intermediate rent, they're, 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 they're really looking at, 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 at getting stuck into that in quite a significant way. Now, sometimes that might take some pressure off, off the social housing uh, uh, lists. In other cases, what it really does is relieve pressure at the other end of the market for, for, from people who otherwise would have bought in, in, in times gone by. But um, you know, there, there are the, the picture is different from, from, from what it was two or three years ago. The sector isn't standing still. It is looking at new ways to provide. But there are obviously um, urban and rural areas in Scotland where there isn't really a market for mid-market rent because there's no uh, major private rented market and you can only have a, a proper um, intermediate rental market where, where you're trying to help people avoid high uh, private rented uh, um, levels and that's not always the case in, 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 in different parts of Scotland. If I could just add to that, in case, in case um, housing associations have been characterised for just you know like putting out the begging bowl without go going to other places to see if we can can help out, I think it's really really important to look at all of the things that we have done. Um, the fact of the matter is we've run out of road. Our management costs are as low as we can get them, and they're, they're, they're comparable to any housing associations in England. Our build costs are way down because of the way in which we procure things, procure things better than we'd have before. Our acquisition costs, in our case, in the Gorbals, are virtually zero because if we're working in a transformational uh, regeneration area, and that's in collaboration with the Council. Our borrowing costs are significantly cheaper than they are for most historic large housing associations in England, for example. The last bond which we got through the Housing Finance Corporation was just marginally above 5%. So they're down at rock bottom. And organisations like ourselves are looking to do our fair share of mid-market rent and shared equity. We've run out of road. Okay. Um, Alex. The, the Bramley research that was mentioned a minute or two ago uh, was used by the government to define the policy over the last couple of years, but that research is now two years old. So if it was done again today, what would it tell us about the financial capacity? Well, the, the Bramley research on housing needs um, was actually, was actually closer to 10 years ago now, and um, that obviously predates the economic crisis, it predates the, the planned changes in welfare. Um, I think what we would anticipate it would build a picture of is that we require shared accommodation, require more one beds, because that's all that welfare will pay for in the future, and there's a chronic shortage. Scottish Government did some very good analysis of the, of the impact of the welfare reforms to identify the real chronic shortage of shared accommodation and, and one bed. So we would anticipate that those would be the types of things that would be coming back. But going by the experiences that we have at Shelter of people who are now turning up for advice and support, 
we're also seeing a new generation of people who previously would have been able to access home ownership having to look at other forms of housing just to, just, just to meet their needs. And I think that's why we certainly identify the private rented sector as an area now worthy of reform to give people the security of tenure that they can't get because they can't access home ownership and they can't access social renting. Um, we need to give them the security so that they can lay down roots in, in their community and raise their children, not be worried about losing their, their home after six months. So, um, <clears throat> whether our needs analysis now, we expect it to be a slightly different picture of what the priorities for investment should be. I'll just before Fraser comes in specifically on the Housing Association front, in terms of the Bramley, the more recent capacity report, uh, CIH would make three uh, uh, brief comments. One, um, it's generally felt that on, the, on, on estimating local authority capacity, it, 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 was, it was just about right. In some cases, there's, there's a feeling it might even have been a slight underestimate. Um, on the Housing Association side, um, notwithstanding what Fraser will, 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 will uh, talk about in, in a moment, um, it, there were flaws it, on a number of assumptions, in, including, for example, the, the, the availability and use of, of, of reserves and, and what, what commitments were already in place for those. Um, but as Gordon says, things have changed even, even since then anyway on, on, on things like the lending uh, uh, um, regime, uh, the, the lack of availability of, of, of reasonable lending rates, and of course, welfare reform. But I would also, uh, again, uh, set, make a warning that, that what the Bramley Capacity Research did was look in a pure numbers uh, way rather than exactly what could be provided, whether it's regenerational um, uh, development, uh, remote uh, rural development. So, again, a warning about playing the pure numbers game. But I'm sure Fraser will have comments on the, the detail of the assumptions made on uh, housing associations. The fact of the matter is that no policy should ever have been predicated or, or premised on what's in the Bramley report because the, the brief for the Bramley report did not allow it, even if the report was going to be any good in the first place, uh, to get to the truth of the matter in relation to the financial capacity of housing associations. Uh, officials set up that brief such that it effectively preset a number of conclusions. It doesn't bear any relationship to reality. There was, for example, absolutely no examination of any housing association's business plans and former projections. It was based simply on a view of surpluses and accounts. It didn't look at enough situations, it didn't interview enough people, and my own opinion is that it's not even worth the paper that it's written on, and things have moved on since then. It does not show what the financial capacity of the sector is. It simply reiterates what senior officials um, several years ago were saying to various committees like Mike Fowlis effectively saying and using the regulator's figures uh, for it to say that um, pretty close to housing associations are awash with cash. They are not, and they're not anywhere near to the degree that the Bramley report would suggest. So I, I don't think it should be given the, the currency or the respect that it appears to have. To develop that slightly, the, I'm aware that there were uh, housing associations which were sitting on fairly strong reserves uh, and some that were fairly well capitalised. Do you feel that the policy that's been uh, pursued over the last two years has been primarily about running down these reserves and forcing housing associations to uh, become less well capitalised? Yes, that's unquestionably the case. Uh, but I'm not arguing that those which have uh, a significant, if you like, surpluses which they don't otherwise require, I'm not arguing that any of these shouldn't be used, but what we said to government that other fairer means must be brought into the funding regime to bring those reserves into play. Um, we are effectively, you know, my own association and others, are effectively volunteering some of our reserves, but we're not going to volunteer all of them, particularly in the context of Glasgow and the West of Scotland, remembering that our boards are made up of people who are really involved in housing because of the terrible housing circumstances they were in, either in the private sector or in local authority housing, where the highest of rents were being charged for the most miserable accommodation and where no repairs were being carried out. Those housing associations are not going down, to the, down the route of bankrupting themselves or ever getting themselves into a position where they cannot manage and maintain the stock that they currently have. So there's a point beyond which you can't go when you're looking at surpluses. If you want to do some hard work on it and properly engage with the sector, I think there is a way of appropriately ensuring that reserves that aren't otherwise needed are brought into play. Would it be fair to say, uh, just on that point, that uh, these reserves were, in effect, uh, a, a, an element of financial capacity, that it was, of course, an option to squeeze them, 
but they can only be squeezed once. And once it's done, it can't uh, be counted uh, again. Uh, absolutely. We've been squeezed. <laughs> you know, that, that's a fact. And I know another, a, a number of other associations have been, and others simply haven't been in a position uh, to be squeezed. But as I say, I th it was offered to government officials that they should look <coughs> uh, more flexibly at how um, excess reserves, if you like, might be able to be utilised. Um, you're, you're looking at a situation where, where the, the, some associations, in particular larger ones, appear to wish to queue up to develop it, develop at all costs. I don't think you'll get that anywhere in Scotland, and I'm very proud of a sector that's prepared to stand its ground and say, I'm sorry, we're not prepared to develop at all costs. You have a situation in England where the Home Group, the Chief Executive of the Home Group, went along to a um, Conservative, Conservative Party uh, conference fringe meeting in order effectively to ask for the reserves and the equity of smaller associations to be given over to larger associations so they can continue their development programmes. Now, that, that, that's the shape, of thing, the shape of things to come in England, and perhaps one of the, the worrying things for Scotland is those very organisations now effectively are in control of a, a significant number of Scottish assets. Is there a message there that suggests that smaller housing associations that still have a reserve should use it now before somebody else does? Um, that's, I, I think but no, because there is no prospect that housing associations that have looked after their businesses properly have in any way, shape or form to join with large UK-based associations. Can There's I, no reason. Can I sort of uh, apologise? I thought you were referring to the, the needs analysis previously, just on the capacity research. Um, I think we need to remember the context of the, the time when that research was, was undertaken. We were facing a situation where there was a very real risk that the social house building sector would disappear. Uh, there was, and the, the context was, how do we find resources to keep things moving? And I think the sector should be commended for re responding. And that did mean housing associations going into reserves and meant a far greater role for, for councils than, than had been previously. But I think the sector did enter into that on the basis that there would be, there would be support in the, in, in the future that you know, once those reserves had been squeezed, we would be at least be a, a former programme of, of finance. What we have seen is that when the, the accelerated capital investment was, was taken out, that became the base level for the future year's budget. So, the, the last year of the last comprehensive spending review, which was a lower level of, of, of overall spend because we had been spent the year previously, that final figure became the, the base point for, for uh, budgeting the following year. That meant we had a massive cut, and that's, what, that's why we're now facing a 45% cut. And I think that's the message very much from the, house, from the, the, the landlords is they can't go any further. Um, and if we are going to have a sustainable future for building more homes and starting to address need, then we need a new solution to that. But the, the Bramley Capacity Research was a, very much a moment in time. And I think it did, I mean, you look at the completions and starts, again, local authorities in 1011 started over 1,400 new, uh, new homes. Um, that's now halved in the, in the space of the last year. So there was that burst, it's now dropped back again. We need to get it back up to, to that previous level. Can I just add one more thing? That the Bradley research do, does point out one thing that, that will, it will lead to a pressure on rents, and quite rightly pointed out. And I think that's the last the last port of call on all of the you know we've, we've, had, we've, we've driven costs down as far as we possibly can. So in order to get income up, and the only place that can come from is rents. The evidence already shows, and we'll be submitting a report on this in the fullness of time uh, once because we've, we've, we've got all of the raw data. The evidence shows that rents have gone up significantly, uh, very significantly, and that trend will continue and that would appear to me to be not a direction of travel that anybody in Scottish Government or Scottish Parliament uh, would like to see things going because the, the people who will suffer the most are the, the people who are the poorest in our society, uh, particularly those in low paid work um, will be, you know, particularly with welfare benefit reform and so, so forth uh, kicking in. Uh, it's going to have really, really serious consequences uh, for, for households and families. So, given that the, the financial constraints are as they are, and you've spoken extensively about that, what feasibly can be done to support the sector in the medium term? One thing we would we would suggest is is a, a, a genuine um, 
transparency from the Scottish Government about, about exactly what is being provided and obviously what's not being provided because perhaps it's more expensive, such that, I mean, it, it recently the, the, a higher grant rate or a higher benchmark rate was, was put in place for houses with, with, with greener features and also one relating to remoter rural areas. We, we're all keenly awaiting the outcome of, 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 of the first of the three-year sort of spending rounds through, through the local authority strategic programmes to see uh, whether, for instance, some of those more expensive uh, provisions are being made because associations uh, and, and local authorities are taking advantage of those somewhat higher grant rates. But it, it, it's all part, it all illustrates the need for a really, really thorough uh, look at, at, at what's being provided and whether it's meeting the right range of needs. Because it may well be, it may well be that, that what, what's going to be part of the answer uh, is, is if, if to widen the range of needs um, appropriately, it, we may be talking about slightly higher uh, grant rates in some cases, considerably higher grant rates in other cases, if it makes the difference between making some provision and making no provision whatsoever. Um, and, and so, but that, that's, that, that will require a very, very close look at what's being provided. Just like to say we've got to point. You, you can't get something for nothing. We've reached that point. There, there is no more to be done. And the last thing to be done is to put rents up significantly. And that's where the pressure is now on. I have no other suggestions. I think government's done everything. Every initiative has been tried. In, in actual fact, if you want to, to, the fact of the matter is things have probably gone backwards in terms of quality and in terms of meeting a lot of other government objectives. Um, you know, which include a whole host of things that we, which we put in our submission. You know, but nobody's measuring greater environmental sustainability, community regeneration, town centre renewal, development of brownfield land. Nobody's actually set actual targets for these things. These are just nice words and nice terms and aspirations, but there's no relationship between them and actual policy and funding policy. Were one to be created, I think you would see that it was a miserable shortfall. Because, for example, amongst other things, and amongst all of this, environmental funding, which used to be part and parcel of the whole uh, availability of grants, is now gone. And, and, you know, I work for a housing association which has deservedly won a lot of awards for placemaking and all the rest of it, UK-wide and indeed Europe-wide. Now, we relied upon generous grant levels and we relied upon environmental um, grant assistance in order to achieve that. Many government documents are predicated with saying that they want to replicate the gorbals. Well, they're not going to at the funding rates that are currently on offer. It's just not going to happen. I mean, just very quickly say the three things we would suggest. Greater transparency in the budget setting process so we can see where the money is going and what we're getting for it. Um, I think, yes, if housing has to take a share of the cuts, then it shouldn't be a disproportionate share of those cuts. So we would ask that the, the cut is reversed to the, the average 33%. Um, and that we start to build a national picture of what the, the level of housing need in Scotland actually is, because we are very concerned that this building programme um, will, in effect, condemn a number of families to, to a, a life of, of, of poverty, um, and that's not what we, we think we should be aspiring to as a nation. Mm. We've looked into this corner uh, for quite a while now, and the, the last question I was going to ask is, uh, if you look in the, the distance, are there any models of affordable housing supply that the government should be considering that are different from the one that they're currently pursuing that might deliver uh, more housing and affordable housing in the future? There, there are, um, as you know, the, the, the development of, of, of intermediate rent has, has been a, a, a sort of uh, understandable uh, flavour of the uh, flavour of the month in, 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 in recent in recent times, and that where there is a market for that, there, there's absolutely no reason for that not to be uh, not to be provided. So, so uh, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, uh, uh, looking at new markets is very relevant. There will be some uh, a small number of providers that, that wish to look at market rent because they think they can do it better than private than, than some private landlords can, and that again is perfectly legitimate uh, that, that we're also that there's a variety of new uh, potential new private finance models out there but again that that's private finance that replaces uh, old private finance that's no longer available from the banks so whilst there's a lot of uh, there are in many ways a lot of new things going on uh, they 
that none of them really provide that kind of magic answer to, to the, 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 the ultimate fact that you need some grant to build uh, houses for, for people on, on low incomes, try, try, you know, in low paid work. Uh, and, and in that sense, it, 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 much as we, we, you know, we do appreciate the Parliament's efforts to try and look round every corner and see, see if there are answers there, it is, it is really hard to get beyond that point. Uh, 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 that, that fact that, 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 that is, uh, you need grant to build, to build houses for, 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 for in terms of social renting. Provision. You talked about uh, market rent and mid-market rent. Uh, is it the case that in some areas of Scotland uh, that could effectively be used to assist in the provision of social housing as well as part of mixed developments? Um, I would just, uh, uh, it, it, it may well be that sales of property, and of course sales are very difficult at the moment in any sector because of, because of the market conditions we're all familiar with, um, sales or full market rent may, to a degree, subsidise uh, social rent par uh, partly. Um, Mid-market rent may well pay for itself, but it doesn't, it doesn't cross-subsidise social rent, and that's in a sense, a, 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 a myth, uh, we, you know, uh, that, that we, we would we would want to stamp down on fairly readily, uh, not to do down mid-market rent in any way, but it doesn't it doesn't cross subsidise social rent. The, the reason why I asked that question was I wanted to go and ask a final question, and that was that if we were looking at achieving that, uh, and if it was achievable, do the problem we then face is that it's achievable in some parts of Scotland but not, not others. So therefore, there is a, a distinct geographical problem with that route. In, in, indeed, it's, it, and, and that's, you, you, you've hit the nail on the head that, that there, there will be areas, there'll be parts of, of Edinburgh, Aberdeen and, and, and various other parts of, of Scotland where, where uh, uh, some, some element of cross-subsidy, because there's such a wide range of market, uh, uh, um, uh, rental market, for, for, for example, um, it, it is there and that makes it possible, but, but other areas where it, it, it just isn't. If I could just, just add, I think there's no direct replacement for grant subsidy to ensure the delivery of so social rent. There's always going to be that need. But there are other things we should be doing. I think we are very clear we will not get the level of house building, social or private, unless we have a buoyant private house building sector. I think there are more things we can do to ensure that there isn't land banking, that when a, pla when a planning application is passed, that it, gets, that it gets going, that land which is identified for housing and social housing uh, is developed in a, in a timely fashion. Um, notwithstanding the, the pressures that, that house builders face, I think we can do more to ensure that the house building sector can, can, can grow again uh, you know, by looking at the planning system, by looking at issues around land and the taxation system to encourage development and ensure that we get the, the Section 75, the 25 per cent uh, on a site of, of, of affordable housing, and that's affordable rather than just social rent, um, and we would rather all went in social rent. Um, but I think there is a role there for government to encourage the, 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 the private house building sector to do more. Okay, um, that answer, Gordon's uh, led neatly on to my question, which is about land supply. Uh, it's generally believed to be a critical factor uh, and potentially an important constraint um, to this type of programme. Um, obviously, this is uh, geographical, but is there sufficient land supply, subsidised or other word, otherwise, and of course include Section 75 uh, affordable housing agreements in this? Um, so, you know, is land supply constraint to the delivery of Scottish um, affordable supply target? And are there particular local markets where land supply is a constraint? Uh, I couldn't answer to the specifics about which local market, but certainly Scotland is not short of land, brownfield or greenfield. Um, what we have, however, got are more difficult to develop sites and more readily developed sites. And what we're seeing is that during this downtime, very few sites at all are, be are being developed. And our real fear is that we don't learn the lessons of the past and that in a rush just to keep the industry going at all, we lose the, the Section 75 agreements and we, we end up have creating highly profitable small developments, but they don't actually start to address the needs of a mixed community, of uh, helping to address housing need, um, and we don't see that, that, that cycle back into a, what we call for a, a healthy housing market. But um, 
others may be better placed to see the, the, the impact on the social house building. From from our point of view, and as a result, as a rule for our members, the, 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 the land is there. It's just the cost of it, you know, the cost of remediation work um, and the cost that in many cases to purchase it off of the council because councils are under such extraordinary, extraordinary financial pressures themselves that they're required to realise receipts and maximise receipts. So the cost of land can be significant even where there is a, a further on cost of remediation work. So um, that, that tends to be what dries up the, the land supply. The actual physical land is there, it's just expensive to develop. Um, and that's been exacerbated by there not being any money for acquisition. So even if you were able to do a, a, a good off-market deal in the private sector, some associations wouldn't be able to do that because they don't have the money up front. In, in years gone by, you would have got the money from the, the Scottish Government or Housing Association grant in order to purchase land so it's part of your land back and so that you could, uh, that would be in your pipeline for the future. It might be two years, it might be four. Uh, associations are no longer doing that and only the larger and more wealthy ones with surpluses are actually able to acquire sites. So, um, there, there is more that can be done. What the government could do in that respect is, is and I, I think to save money in the programme overall, you know, to, to answer some questions earlier on, is they're just going to have to bite the bullet and start paying, paying for costs as they're incurred because it is the most efficient use of public resources. At the moment, £3,000 per unit of public money is being wasted because you're paying on completion. It is not an efficient use of public money. I would, I would just add on land, um, uh, obviously if you build less houses across all the sectors, uh, then you need less land. It's less of a problem than it felt like it was uh, in, in the boom time. Uh, but as, as, as Fraser has said, it's all about the, the cost of the land, whether you're talking about remote rural uh, uh, um, land which may not be fully fully serviced, including uh, obviously by, uh, by, by uh, water, um, or whether it's contaminated brownfield land. That, that's, that's the issue. It, it, it's can you afford to, to use the land you've got, as, as Fraser has said. And in your experience, um, are councils feeling um, pressure from house builders on the Section 75 affordable housing agreements? You certainly picked up um, some public statements that uh, have called for a, a lessening or a, a, loose, a loosening of those, those structures. Um, we would urge decision makers to ensure that we stick to, to those. We don't want to repeat the previous history of, of failed communities uh, and would certainly rather that we built quality developments, quality communities, so that we don't end up in the situation where we have been in the past, where the, sec the public sector has to step in and pick up the bills for, for field developments. Thanks. Um, Jim. Thank you, convener. Uh, can I turn to the issue of welfare reform, um, which has been touched on earlier by the witnesses? Um, I note that you have each in your written submissions expressed concern about the introduction of universal credit and the impact that that will have on the supply of affordable housing. Um, and I would imagine that overall what the concern is about the impact on the income stream of social landlords. But I'd like to ask you specifically, if, uh, if I may, what you think the impact will be of paying universal credit directly to benefit claimants. And also if you could tell us what you think the impact will be um, on the reduction in housing benefit for those who are seen to be, um, in quotes, under-occupying a property? Um, the direct impact will be an increase in homelessness. That, will be the, that, that is what we are anticipating. We will see an increase in the number of people unable to, to afford to keep the home that they're in, and um, there is n no prospect of there being sufficient supply of one beds, um, or shared accommodation, which could help mitigate that, that problem, um, we think. And it is because of that reason, because of those welfare reforms, that we're so disappointed by the 45% cut in the capital budget, because, as I said before, it does feel a bit like a, a, a one-two knockout punch to, to people that need access to this type of housing. So we would argue that because of the welfare reforms, now is the time to be investing more in new build social housing. I think so. Yeah, would put slightly uh, 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 different emphasis on, 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 on the very, very sort of grave implications of welfare reform in the sense that in the social rented sector, 
Um, I certainly uh, would, agree, would, we would agree with Gordon that in terms of the, the pressures are already now on the private rented sector from welfare reform, then increases in homelessness may, may well result there. I think in the social sector, um, if some tenants struggle to pay their rent because, because maybe because of uh, difficult circumstances that they're in or, or chaotic lifestyles, and in a, in a, minor, a very small minority of cases, perhaps blatant uh, non-payment, um, if, if, if that happens, and indeed tenants that are, are struggling to pay uh, the shortfall as a result of the bedroom tax, I, d I wouldn't make an assumption that, that that would result in more homelessness from the social rented sector, because what that's suggesting is that, is, is that uh, uh, councils and housing associations will put such pressure on tenants in that situation that, uh, that they'll, they'll lead to uh, abandonments and evictions. And I would like to think at the moment that, 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 that that's not necessarily the result. But if that wasn't the result, then the implication is the social landlord takes the hit. And that's where uh, in income streams, uh, uh, ability to maintain existing homes, and certainly, uh, as has been alluded to already, any, any flexibility in, in relation to what you can fund in terms of new build is, it has, has, has really gone. I think we just need to be, be, be wary about, about saying that there'll be increased homelessness from the, from the social rented sector. That may not be the case, but, but, but the implication for the, is the landlords taking the hit. I think you've got the answer to the question. It's, it's, um, it's either going to be homelessness or arrears. And, you know, I think uh, a lot of housing associations are modelling what the, the arrears impact will be. In our case, we are presuming around 2% going up to 5% for around five years. Um, that may well be over-optimistic. If, if our arrears go up to a 5% level, if they more than double, then the, the financial consequences are absolutely horrendous. They amount to, if you want to capitalise that, they would amount to a loss of £3,000 per existing unit. So um, I think the, the, the prospect of there being spare capacity, and there were questions about who's got spare capacity and how it might be used, any spare capacity, capacity that there is is going to be eroded by this. And I would echo what David has said. I think the social housing sector is going to have to find ways and means of ensuring that homelessness is not the result of this. Um, but the, there's a long way to go, I think, in welfare reform. And, and when it actually happens, it, it's going to be a huge social issue. There's no question about it. Absolute massive social issue. And I just keep my fingers crossed every day that they don't ever find a computer that's able to do it. In terms of the, the um, exercise, Mr Stewart, that you've undertaken, um, which you've just referred to, uh, were you able to quantify specifically what the impact would be of paying universal credit directly? No, no, we weren't. And uh, uh, you, you could look at other research in that respect. The, the, the universe, uh, there, there have been pilot schemes run, run in England and one in Scotland, but they're so small that you can't really draw, you know, take any consequences from that. The GHA have created a model which seeks to second guess exactly what the, the, the consequences will be. But you won't know until it happens, end of. And you won't be able to judge it until a year or two thereafter, because there'll have to be a change in culture. But the immediate impact of it is going to be horrendous. There's no question about that. And the immediate impact of it being paid direct, um, it would be you know, broaching in the, the unmanageable for some associations. And certainly I think every association that will be planning and putting all of their available staff resources and bringing in additional resources to try to get all of their tenants up to speed, to try to deal with their vulnerable tenants, to try to make sure that the advice is out there. And I know that the Scottish Government is very supportive of any initiatives that seek to mitigate the effects of, of, of particularly that aspect of welfare reform, and that's welcome. Just on that very specific point about the Scottish Government's response, what further measures do you think the Scottish Government can take to mitigate the impact of these reforms, particularly, well, specifically on um, housing supply? On housing supply? Uh, well, sorry, I was just going to say, in terms of what they can do and, uh, to aid the you know, likes of Fraser's tenants who are hard to reach groups. Um, we were disappointed that they didn't pass on some of the mitigation money that was coming from Westminster into advice services. Um, it's going to be crucial that hard to reach uh, tenants and other people who are concerned about what's going to happen to their benefits are able to access impartial uh, advice and, and support. And we are seeing at a Scottish level and at a local level uh, deep cuts to services like those that Shelter Scotland provide and also Citizens Advice and, and others. 
I would just echo that. The, the, the crucial thing is that, that I wasn't actually aware of the fact that they hadn't passed on um, certain monies which were anticipated as, as going into those services. It's crucial that those services are supported as, uh, as generously as possible because it is going to be a very, very difficult period for tenants and landlords alike. Mr. Bootbinder. I would just say, uh, well, I mean, CIH has been, a, 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 we've been very glad to have been a recipient of a, of a modest amount of Scottish Government support to help uh, uh, social landlords get, you know, prepare in, in as practical ways as possible for the reforms. And that, that, that's certainly been very welcome. That programme uh, is ongoing and it will also include good practice guidance uh, going out to, to social landlords. Uh, 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 the first part of that being, being in, the, in, in the next week or so. Um, but I think the, the bigger picture is exactly, as, as Gordon has mentioned, is about advice services. Given, given that we're talking about reserved matters, the one, one of the key parts of the, of, of the scene that isn't, isn't reserved and is within the, the, the gift of the, of the Scottish Government is, 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 ad, is, is funding, is proper funding of advice services, um, whether through direct grant or through, through uh, assisting, supporting local authorities to do that, because that's one, that's one area where, where the Scottish Government can make a difference. And I would probably add a general comment that I do think probably the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament probably need to be aware that whilst they're taking a, a very welcome interest in, in welfare reform, there is a risk of raising expectations that, 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 that the Scottish Parliament can do more to mitigate the impacts than perhaps it, it can. Uh, and that, that, is, that, that, that is something that, that, that I think uh, Parliament needs to watch. Okay, Adam. Okay, uh, this year we're moving to multi-year resource planning assumptions, which we, we touched on earlier, with local authorities taking much more of a lead in the development funding process um, across Scotland, marrying um, spend to local need. What do you expect to be the main advantages and disadvantages uh, of this process and practice? Can I start off with that? Um, I, I think we've, it, there, is, there are a number of very welcome uh, uh, elements. First of all, the fact that we now have a three-year programme is, is really significant. It, it's been a bit of a, a stuttering uh, uh, past in, in terms of ability to plan ahead. Uh, so the, the, the fact that it's a three-year programme is good. It's not, of course, a three-year rolling programme. So we've got quite a potentially difficult issue building up that if local authorities and indeed the Scottish Government with its overview of the programme are very cautious in terms of what they approve next year and the year after, then by default we'll have created a smaller housing budget uh, for, from 2015 onwards. So um, I, I do believe the Scottish Government's aware of that issue and, and we, we, we all need to work together to see if we can create a, a rolling programme rather than just one three-year programme and then another. Um, I think another, uh, whilst we await the outcome, uh, uh, it, hopefully in the next few weeks, to see what round, you know, year one of the, of the new system has, has brought, one aspect that we really did welcome was it was entirely logical for local authorities with their strategic role to, have, to be taking a, 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 have greater influence over the distribution of resources. Um, uh, two things to watch. One is it's a challenge for some local authorities that are both builders and strategic planners. How much money goes into their own building? How much money into RSLs? That's that's something uh, where we'll be we'll be looking closely at, at, at what the balance is. Um, the the other issue is the extent to which uh, we, the, the money gets spent. I mean, we welcome very much the fact that the Scottish government is retaining an overall. Uh, control, if you like, uh, uh, or overview of, of the situation, so that if a site slips in one council area, the money can be via quickly to another area, and, and that put, put that can be put back, uh, put right at a, at, a, at a later time. So that retention of overall Scottish government control is is certainly a very welcome feature. I think you asked what the benefits and what the or what the advantages and what the disadvantages. The advantages should be. Um, a more strategic overview that ensures that homes go where they're needed rather than just simply where there's the capacity to, to do it. Um, I'm not sure that that will necessarily be the result. The disadvantages, um, we are looking at, it's less transparent when you're able to see where's, what's going where and, and, and when. Um, and I think the other issue with the, the three-year plan is it should mean, what well, it should be an advantage because it should be more homes. And I think it is worth noting that 700, 770 million is an increase in what was originally announced in the budget, but we haven't seen an increase in the target. The target's still the same target that was fully funded um, at, I think, 600 and 
20 or 600 million pounds um, when, when John Finney first did the comprehensive spending review. So we would hope that a three-year plan does enable additional investment to be more quickly added to the pot and able to, to increase the overall supply when funds become available. I think what I would add to that is that something that's been, been lost in all of the changes is the, the loss of housing associations submitting annual strategy development funding plans, which allowed there to be a, a, a very serious attention given to the bottom-up component of planning, and it allowed housing associations to bid for sites and to make the case for uh, the strategic importance of what they might be doing. That's been completely and utterly lost, and I think you know, before what we had was a, uh, quite a healthy combination um, uh, and I'm talking about four any changes three or four years ago, a healthy combination of top down and bottom up, and there being a, a, a health, healthy compromises made and nothing being overlooked, and it was certainly an accountable and transparent planning process for everybody concerned, including government. We've lost that completely, and it should just be reinstated. It's as simple as that. There was nothing wrong with it. It worked very well, uh, and uh, that's what's been lost. So the bottom up. Part of the bottom-up approach has been lost, and that's unfortunate. I, I would add to that, I can only talk for Glasgow. Things are working uh, well in Glasgow at the moment, and I think there's a lot of support and there's a lot of knowledge of what, the, what local priorities is, well, well strategic priorities. But that's not necessarily guaranteed always to be the case, and we could do with a system that has that as an inbuilt feature. Okay. Um, could I just come back to this point about the, the, it not being a three-year rolling programme? Uh, and the fact that the approvals will, will basically set the budget uh, for future years. Could you explain that a little bit more and what we actually need to do to ensure that that doesn't happen? Well, um, just to, to uh, it is, it, we're all, we all struggle to get our heads around this, this, uh, the way in which now, uh, 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 as has been mentioned earlier, that funding is paid out on completion. So, for instance, at the start of the next spending round from April 15 onwards, the money, for instance, in that year, 15 16, that is, that it, the, the, the housing budget will be spent by paying out on completions of, a, of schemes approved 12, 24 months before that. If not enough has been approved, in 13, 14, and 14, 15, because of worries that it's, for, it's making a commitment to money when you don't know whether that money will be there, then by default, the housing budget will, will be lower. It won't need to be higher because you can only pay out, if you're only paying out on completion and you've not approved enough, you haven't got, you haven't got as much to pay out on. So there, there does need to be a degree, I suppose, of, in, a, in a sense of cross-party uh, uh, working uh, with government to make sure that an acceptable, decent level of, 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 of homes, uh, um, uh, as a minimum to meet to meet existing targets, um, can, can be committed to into the next programme. Obviously, the next programme crosses into the the area of, an, of, of a new administration. Um, and so, hence the need for, a, 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 a hopefully, a consensual approach to making sure that, uh, that uh, approvals don't quietly start, start dropping because of caution. That, that would seem to, to uh, make an argument for more, more strategic control at uh, a Scottish Government level as opposed to devolving um, uh, control to, to local authorities, is it not? Is that not... Um... Balance can be there in, in the system that we've got now. I mean, the, ultimately, the money, it, it, it comes from... Um, comes from Scottish Government and, and uh, you know, uh, CIH is certainly comfortable with it being uh, dealt with a local authority approach, but I think, I think lo local, local authority, you know, local authority, neither local authorities uh, nor, nor, nor Scottish Government uh, are, are going to be able to uh, commit to a specific level of, of, of approvals um, without some sense of, of, of master planning in to, in, in to cover the, 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 the start of the next spending review. Uh, 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 otherwise, um, uh, uh, we, we really are going to see a, a, a sort of default uh, fall. But the, the fact that the Scottish Government, I mean, it is retaining overall control. Uh, that, so, so it's not as if this has been completely uh, devolved for local authorities to fund out of their own resources, as has happened in some, some other areas. This is, the Scottish Government is still in control of, 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 of the monies. Even, even for Edinburgh and Glasgow, it still ultimately comes as, as Scottish Government monies. Okay. Any other? I, mean, I would concur with that. I think we, we all want to avoid a situation where we 
sleepwalk into an underspend in, the, in, in an already you know, well-cut uh, housing budget. And I think that will require us to do more to support councils and local authorities to get more approvals through um, before we hit that final date. Uh, I mean, I'm concerned it flows from what Glasgow City Council have told us that the, the consequence of all of that is they've compressed all their planned site starts into next financial year, 13-14, and they can't plan for anything after 14-15, and that would just seem crazy to us. And uh, To get back to some of the very, very original, in, original and initial questions, uh, whether or not what they plan to do is achievable is very much open to question. You know, we play a, uh, my own association plays quite a large and prominent role in that program, and it's only you know it's only now that we are being asked to confirm whether or not we can afford to do everything that we're penciled in for. And my fear is is that we can't, um, and that goes back to the you know the balance of the program being 70-30. Well, it should be 100 anyway. Social rent being 70-30 will drift towards 3070 to make the programme work and, and at that point you, you, you get you get complete confusion. I mean just, just add on that you know we've already got a situation in Scotland where some social rents are higher than some so called mid market rents. So you know a definition of social housing would probably help in all of this. But a rolling programme I think is probably essential for, for longer term planning. Um, I suppose the other aspect, if you're moving to more uh, lo uh, the more local decision making, the effect of the pressures on local government settlement itself or on local authorities and how that impacts on um, a, on their specific decisions and the outcomes locally, and can we be confident that spending decisions on affordable su supply in this context of cuts and squeeze across the board um, the our, you know affordable su supply would be protected decisions will be protected or funding protected I don't think um, from CIH point of view uh, we don't have worries that, that about that money somehow uh, disappearing we would expect complete transparency on, 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 on behalf of in turn local authorities and then the Scottish government as to what what the money uh, in the affordable housing supply programme has funded. I, I, I guess it's possible that for local authorities' own house building programmes, then where there are squeezes uh, on, on, on um, the, the general fund and, 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 and the general fin fin financial pressure that local authorities are under, that might limit their ability to, to build up a package which enables them to use their £30,000 subsidy and then supplement that with other, other local... Uh, sources for their own program, but I wouldn't expect pressures on local authorities to have any impact on uh, making sure that the money that comes from the affordable housing supply program isn't isn't spent fully. Um, during some of the answers, um, we've already alluded to the kind of longer term implications for um, the uh, RSL sector of. Um, the way that money's uh, provided and the grant rates and um, the shift to, as we've seen south of the border, to uh, larger um, associations. Um, to what extent will the long-term impact of the shift in funding and provision for affordable housing affect the, the housing association sector, do you think? Is consolidation inevitable or is it desirable? And if not, is it preventable? Um, it's certainly not inevitable. It's certainly not desirable, and it certainly is preventable. Although that could that could be helped by some further um, legislation. It's pretty well accepted and demonstrable south of the border that um, mergers and acquisitions ha were more related to the retirement age of chief executives. Uh, than they were to actually any benefit flowing from uh, those mergers and acquisitions. And a lot of research and reviews have been done of them, and they haven't led to lower borrowing costs. And we're all getting sick of saying you can't borrow money unless you're absolutely huge. It's total nonsense. Um, big, in my opinion, is not beautiful. There's a backlash in England at the moment, but those voices are not being heard loudly enough. And there is a serious concern that some... UK-based organisations or English-registered organisations are acting in what is fundamentally a predatory manner. Um, I think that any associations 
that feel that they have to merge with or, or, or become subsidiaries of UK-based organisations like, for example, Irvine and, uh, as we understand it, the West of Scotland Housing Association. We're now up to 20,000 houses like that. Um, if, if people are looking to merge, they, need to, they look, need to look at themselves in terms of how they've run their organisations for the last 10 or 20 years. It's certainly not something that any of the organisations that I'm familiar with have to do and there is no clear attraction to it. And the loss of autonomy, the loss of commitments to communities, whether that's uh, physical communities or communities of interest, uh, would, in my opinion, mean that the associations concerned have lost their raison d'etre. Why would they continue? You know, what is the point in being a housing association? In many respects, you know, you, people would be happier with the accountability of a local authority rather than a huge landlord, which appears to have actually uh, no root in the tenants that they serve. I would just add that there may be a, a, a slight implication in the question that if, if, an, if a housing association isn't developing, then it needs to look at rationalising or, or, or merging. Um, I, I think it's almost the, the opposite at the moment, that if an association isn't developing, it's probably got a lot, a lot lower risk profile than one that is. So there's no reason why uh, even small associations with, with 500 units or less um, can't, can't carry on as a landlord if, if, if rents are affordable, tenants are, ha are happy with the service they get. I, I cannot see any reason why the current development profile, and that is changing, it's obviously less developing associations, uh, would have any impact on a particular uh, small uh, association's ability to su survive into the future. Yes, there are other threats that we've, we've heard about, not least from welfare reform, but the lack of development in itself doesn't, doesn't lead to, to a, a pressure to merge as far as CIH can see. We're sheltered. Scotland, we're obviously not a, a landlord, um, so we're very much observers on this issue. But will it happen? Um, it would appear to be the direction of travel in, in some places. Should it happen? Well, I think it's, it's up to the advocates of those mergers to demonstrate the benefits to tenants and prospective tenants uh, that, would, that would fall from that. We would certainly take a, 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 a kind of pragmatic view that anything which increases the overall supply of social rented properties that are in, of good quality and in the, the right places um, should be welcomed. Um, but I think those business management decisions um, are rightly the responsibility of, of individual associations. Um, all I would say is if they have a national policy level, if there is capacity, be it through land or, or, or borrowing, then they should certainly be encouraged and supported to, to build uh, as, as well as they can. Gordon? Yeah, I'll have to ask about meeting housing needs. Uh, I know some of the evidence this morning has already touched upon this. Um, we've heard already that we need to build 10,000 uh, socially rented homes a year. And given that the spending allocation for new affordable homes will achieve less than that, uh, what are your views on whether enough priority is given to rural housing, development of brownfield sites and special need housing? And is there enough targeted, targeting to meet the needs of people who are on low incomes, poorly housed or homeless? Um, I think fundamentally we would say not enough priority has been, been given to housing at the strategic level. Um, there is clear evidence that People are suffering, people are struggling to keep a roof over their head, be they renters or homeowners, we are seeing people just trying to struggle to, to pay the, the, the household bills. Looking forward, this programme is not a programme to address house, housing need, this is a, a programme to deliver the government's target. We believe that it, this is actually a question about what country do we want to be, do we want to be a country where everyone has a secure, affordable home, be that renting or, or, or owning, or do we want to be a country that just keeps the, the a subsistence level of house building going? Um, from where we sit just now, we're going to be that subsistence level building. Um, and I think that's not what we would hope is the aspiration for, for Scotland. I would just add... Um, the, the, we've got to watch the, the potential disconnect between the, supply, the housing supply programme and wider uh, government objectives. I mean, l l take an example of, of, of the ageing population. W we, we reluctantly have to accept that at the moment and in recent years and probably in the next few years, 
the amount of specialist provision, uh, housing and care provision for older people is just not going to be what it what it was once, and we may have to reluctantly accept that. What what we find what we would find more difficult to accept is that if mainstream housing that's built to a standard that, for instance, is, is suitable for wheelchair users, uh, it, it isn't being it isn't being provided adequately, then that's a serious disconnect because that's that's a, an extra cost, but it's nothing like the complexity of building a, a specialist uh, scheme, uh, ho housing and care scheme for older people. Um, and a, a report that CIH has supported that will come out from Horizon Housing Association shortly will highlight the, the, the shortfall of, of, of mainstream housing for, for, for wheelchair users. And of course, if we're talking about an aging population, then as people get older uh, and have increasing frailty, then that's a very, it's a very easy, easy answer to, to, to build housing of the, of the right standard for, for, to, to address a particular need. But it's a perfect example uh, of... of the anxieties we have about slightly more expensive provision getting squeezed. All of the all of the things that you mentioned there with the special needs brownfield site, um, remote rural connection um, communities, to develop there and to develop that those types of housing cost more money. They will be the first things to be squeezed. And the huge concern here, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is that government officials are not seeking to measure the impact of these proposals on things like that. And these are the things which really we should be agreeing as a society what the outcome needs to be, what we need to create, and then to see how, you know, how, how policy and funding arrangements are contributing towards um, these things being developed and targets being met. But targets are not being set and the incentive is not to do any of these things. Brownfield's expensive, special needs is expensive, remote rural relocations is expensive. And other than little bits of money maybe being given out and they're becoming less and less, nothing is being done to assist that. And it's all unit costs and it's, it's not going to meet the overall needs of the country. Yeah, given that we've got 32 local authorities and a lot of them cover uh, rural areas, the government has stated that 20,000 homes should be built for social rent, with the local authorities building 5,000 houses. Do you agree with this al allocation, and do you have any views on whether the council uh, build target is achievable? Um, we'd like the target to be more, um, so we welcome any, any target that lets us identify what delivery has been, but it should be greater. Um, we think there is a role for local authorities, a larger role than there has been in the past, but I don't think we should lose sight of the overall picture of, of social housing, just because one part of the social housing sector is doing a wee bit more shouldn't result in the other part doing considerably less, and I think that's one of the areas we are concerned about. I think there are particular issues in, in rural and remote communities that haven't been properly addressed, and I think as, as Fraser and David identify there are particular reasons why it's harder to do that. Um, this is why we very much welcome the Minister's uh, commitment to doing a, a national overview of the, the local needs analysis, because we do need to identify what are the homes that Scotland requires, what is it that we want social housing to deliver, is it about better communities or is it just about throwing up units here, here there and everywhere. Um, and once we get a national programme that is actually about addressing housing needs and about building better communities, then we can start to move into a place where we're starting to build more homes than we lose every year, um, and that will only be a positive thing. The issue about remote rural areas is an interesting one when, when taken with the question of the council house uh, contribution to the programme, because if, as CIH suspects, we will need to see a, 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 an increase in the proportion of the social rented programme that councils take on, it will be intriguing to see whether the more difficult, for instance, uh, remote rural sites are, are, are what councils can step into providing, because, of course, traditionally, those have been provided by, by, by uh, often very local housing associations with, with, with very reasonable levels of, of grants. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, what the, it, there's a national broad issue about councils taking a, a greater proportion, but will, will it be for the more difficult provision? That's an interesting question. I'm not in a, really in a position to comment on you know, rural uh, issues and local authorities. Uh, just my final question, the, the date for the delivery, delivery of the homelessness 2012 commitment is uh, almost upon us. What impact do you think the current levels of affordable housing supply will have on the delivery of that commitment? 
It will make it harder for local authorities to ensure settled accommodation for everyone who is unintentionally homeless. Um, I'm not sure that the 2012 commitment itself will be a, a, a cause of greater complexity for local authorities. I think the, the overall reduction in house building just puts added pressure on, on overall supply. I think it's important to, to recognise that we are still in a position where the majority of people who do get settled accommodation have spent time on the, the waiting list. Um, the 2012 Homeless Commitment, we would argue, is, is one of the most progressive achievements of this Parliament and should be recognised as such. But it does require local authorities to look again at prevention, support, advice. And it's not just about supply. It's not just about getting access to temporary accommodation. It's about the service that you deliver as a local authority to people who become homeless, because there is more we can do to prevent homelessness in the first place. Questions that like to ask? Um, that's been very thorough, gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for your evidence today. You've certainly given us a lot, given us a lot of questions that we'll be putting uh, to the relevant ministers. So, uh, thank you very much for that. Can I just suspend this session briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the room and the new ones to take their seats?
Okay, if we move swiftly on to agenda item two, the Water Resources Scotland Bill, um, the committee will now hear further evidence on this bill um, at stage one from energy and environmental organisations. So can I welcome the witnesses who are Dr. Sarah Hendry, lecturer in law at the IHP Help Centre for Water Law Policy and Science, which some of us um, visited uh, a couple of weeks ago. Adrian Johnson, technical director at MWH, Institution of Civil Engineers Scotland, Mark Sut Stutter, Head of Research, Catchments and Coats, Coasts at the James Hatton Institute, and Ian Cowan, co-convener of the Water Subgroup, UK Environmental Law Association. UKILA, is that correct? <coughs> can I <coughs> thank you all for, your, for submitting your written evidence, and Margaret, can I invite you to start the questioning on this session too? Good morning to you all. Um, can I ask you what your views, uh, what is your view of the government's overall ambition for Scotland to become a hydro nation? And do you think that the bill goes some way to help to achieve that? Start. I yeah. Our centre is very supportive of the government's decision to focus policy agendas on water. So we're very keen to work with the government and other stakeholders to take the hydro nation concept forward. And yes, we do think that the, the first part of this bill is, is an attempt to give some, some legislative expression to, to the ideas underpinning that. I would second that, that uh, we certainly, as a, an academic research institution, um, tied up with the, the water environment in Scotland, um, recognise that this is an, an important step towards firming up some of the, uh, the hydro nation agenda. Um, the, Scotland certainly has the ability to, uh, to sell some of its water expertise under this badge of hydrogenation and uh, this bill um, sort of protecting this economic, societal and environmental benefits um, through, through this bill will certainly add to that. Um, it would just be nice to, to maybe see how they are more closely linked. The economic relies on the societal, relies on the environmental, and for how, um, how for important economic revenue creating sections of Scotland, food and drink, land management, tourism, and energy sectors in particular, um, that you could wrap these things together a bit more tightly in this bill. I would certainly agree um, very much from the point of view of the Institution of Civil Engineers. We very much welcome the bill um, and, and the part it plays in pushing forward the Hydro Nation agenda. Um, and we recognise that the Water Resources Bill is only a part of that, of that agenda. Um, I think, in general, we see the, the bill and the agenda very much um, helping Scotland to maximise the benefits of what it's already good at doing in the water sector and to continue to build capability in addressing complex issues of sustainable water management and of further increasing Scotland's competitiveness on the world stage in this area. Uh, UKLA uh, does support the, uh, the, the Hydro Nation agenda and the, the, the intention to make the most of Scotland's water resources and Scotland's undoubted expertise in, uh, in water matters. Uh, although we do have some concerns about uh, particular aspects of the bill. Thank you. Um, can I ask what your views are on the adequacy of the consultation that took place prior to the introduction of the bill? And are you satisfied with the Scottish Government's response to any concerns that you raised during the consultation phase? The consultation generally good. There were two government consultations, although the second of those was for a shorter period than we would usually expect. The, the bill team, the officials working on both hydronation and the bill were really helpful. They were happy to come to meetings that we organised around hydronation and the bill. Um, the only thing I think would be part two of the bill, which came as a surprise to many of us when the parliamentary bill was, was published. I would say that I've been aware of, of quite a good background to the, the overall hydrogenation agenda through public meetings, 
um, talk in the academic and water industry sectors. Um, with regard to the specifics of the bill, um, I was more involved in the, the stage of, of replying to the written evidence of the specific bill wording as, as we're talking of today, rather than the previous meetings. Yes, similarly, I haven't been involved um, in, in, in great deal in the uh, consultation stage, but um, certainly in paying the written evidence and, and, the receipt and the discussions that we've had, we found that a very helpful process. Uh, I've got nothing to add to what uh, Sarah has already said. <laughs> the committee has heard evidence, mainly I think from Consumer Focus Scotland, that a recent European Commission consultation on the blueprint to safeguard Europe's waters may have implications for the development of Scotland's water resources and the bill proposals. Are you satisfied that, the, well I wonder what your general view on that is, and are you satisfied that the bill as currently drafted takes account of the drive at European level in relation to developing water resources? Well, we'll need to wait and see what the, the output of the, the blueprint consultations are. That's been a wide-ranging exercise and will feed in, as I understand it, to a great deal of future work that the Commission will undertake in water over the, the medium term. I think in the short term, I wouldn't anticipate anything in the bill that, that would cause a problem for, for whatever the blueprint may be. The one thing that I think may arise from that, that exercise is issues around water efficiency in buildings. Um, the bill doesn't directly deal with that, but it certainly isn't in, in conflict with, with that kind of, of policy step. Uh, in, in my knowledge of the, the EU um, proposals going into the blueprint, it seems that some of the the pillars of that are the, the water quantity um, and quality um, aspects, but also uniting those with other key areas of, of policy, such as um, habitat, um, societal benefits from water, recreation, well-being, all those kind of things, and uh, the industrial side, importantly, too. So uh, that's important, and it does seem that um, the fact that these policies act in isolation does stop uh, at times, um, benefits being realised in the water sector. Um, you may stop, uh, there may be conflicts between, say, dredging under car regulations and achieving actual flood management, or there may be um, opposing regulations between a new technique for dealing with um, removing wastes going into the water stream um, from sewage, say, and uh, regulations for where that sewage should be. Directed, so there are there are policy kind of trade-offs that need to be looked at, and I think that's one of the opportunities that this bill could go into a little more, is to kind of start to unite those policies together, so these clashes and trade-offs don't happen and impede some of the um, the more visionary stuff that the bill is trying to get in place. Certainly, I think building on that one aspect that um, certainly we think that the hydrogenation agenda will need to pursue is is the best possible. Co collaboration between different institutions and uh, um, uh, different groups across Scotland to ensure that we have a truly integrated approach to the management of, of Scotland's water and uh, integrated approach to the way that we are talking to, 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 to the rest of the world about that. So I think this issue of collaboration and understanding how different institutions interact in an efficient way, avoiding duplication and so on, would be a, is an important aspect to be considered. Uh, one of the things that UKLA has sought to, uh, it w with its comments, to emphasise is the uh, recognition and the need for the bill to recognise that uh, water has inherent value on its own uh, as a, as a in, in its place in the water environment, uh, uh, and a, it's it's a, uh, a fact that the European Water Framework Directive does recognise recognise this. By, stating that water is not a commercial product like any other, but rather a heritage which must be protected, defended, and treated as such. Uh, so um, I would just add, add that to my earlier comments uh, in the European context. Thank you. And sticking with the European theme, it may be that um, only, well, I don't know if anyone can answer this question, really, but I suppose it's just for our own interest. We're interested in whether any other European uh, countries are carrying forward 
similar or parallel legislation uh, with the aim of protecting water resources or indeed any other water policies that you're aware of from other um, European countries that are being legislated for? As far as I know, no one else is, is looking at a hydronation agenda in that broad, um, broad and focused sense, because the hydronation is broad, but the government is focused on it. I think that almost all European countries have made substantial changes to their water law and accompanying policy in, in recent years in order to implement the Framework Directive and the other EU water legislation that's come along with that, and, and that will probably continue. So I think they've all been doing that, but not with the, the same hydro, hydronation focus. Okay, well, let's just turn our attention to England and Wales rather than the whole of Europe. Um, other con um, witnesses also, uh, I think again, Consumer Focus Scotland and Scottish Southern Energy referred to the opening of the non-domestic water and sewage market in England and Wales to competition and um, there, I think there was some discussion about possible impact of that. Um, I just wonder whether you've got any um, comments on how that might impact on the proposals in the bill and how perhaps might the bill anticipate such changes? Well, I think there will be opportunities for Scottish business stream in the opening up of the market in England and Wales. There will obviously be opportunities in Scotland for companies taking up the, the new challenge of a, a more open market south of the border. I don't think, again, there's anything in the bill. I think the, the bill clarifies a number of things in relation to Scottish Water and the subsidiary companies, which I think will be helpful in terms of that process. But the, the bill in England is at an early stage, and what will actually happen in England is not wholly clear, I think. And it would be nice to think that those working in the sector in England, in the water services sector, are fully up to speed on all the interesting things that have already been done in Scotland in terms of opening up the retail market and are taking the, the fullest advice from the Water Industry Commission in particular in relation to our experiences here. I think that um, certainly uh, what's been happening in Scotland is working well and uh, I think that there's uh, Scotland can see itself as an exemplar for um, how that could be progressed uh, in the wider uh, United Kingdom. Um, overall, though, I think that the, the, the issue of the um, horizontal um, uh, layering of, of, of uh, the uh, different aspects of, of water supply and delivery um, needs to, you know, Scotland needs to um, let me let me stop there. Um, sorry, if I I'll come back to that. Sorry. I don't really have anything to add. I'm afraid I can't help you there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's <coughs> okay, Adam. <coughs> Mr. Cairns already touched on the, the issue of value of Scotland's uh, water resource, and there has been some criticism that. Perhaps the definition of value in the bill is too narrowly focused, too, too much to do with the exploitation, if you like, of the resource as an, an economic asset. Um, how, would the, how would you like to see the bill reshaped with the, the type of definition that you're, you're looking for? How would that actually reshape the bill itself? And would, it, would there be other proposals that would flow from um, a redefinition, if you like? Uh, well, I think the, the first thing that UKLA would like to see would be, a, a, as I said, an explicit recognition that water has an inherent value which is not economic, um, which is just of a wider social and environmental value. Um, I think there's a phrase in the bill that uh, uh, well, the, the definition of value includes economic and other benefit. So, and responses to date have been to say that uh, environmental and social aspects are covered by that, but the, we still feel that the, the, the dominant um, drive is economic. 
And I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a difficulty when uh, you're trying to promote a, such a, a wide-ranging agenda as the hydronation agenda um, in finding the right words to express uh, in legislation what you're trying to do. Um, and it occurred to you, Kayla, that possibly legislation is not the, cur not, not the way to address the, the hydronation agenda, uh, that there may, may be other ways of doing it. Um, but having opted for a legislative approach, I think it's important that uh, that, that uh, the bill is explicit about those other values which which uh, need to be stated in order to to, to uh, make it clear to anyone reading it that it's not just about uh, development. Which, which has, a, has the, the word development has its own, own connotations. The word value has its connotations. The word resource also could be viewed as quite an anthropocentric uh, concept. So um, there are, th through all those terms, there's a, there's a risk that uh, economic values might be um, uh, predominant. Uh, so, I th I th so it's important, we think, to to add in, you know, to, to explicitly, rather than saying economic and other benefit, um, to, to say economic, social and environmental benefits. I'm curious to know that other people, other witnesses uh, uh, take on that, and would it make any significant difference to the bill and its proposals if we did alter the definition along the lines of Mr Cowan suggests? Yes. I do think that's a, a, a fascinating area, and I, I see the the bill as um, paving the way for lots of um, future developments by setting out the kind of groundwork for these, and it, it does that um, justifiably so in in terms of um, handling effluents and um, and waste and water abstraction, drought orders, things like that. But you could extend that further to um, to uh, use the way that water can be seen as a, a sort of um, a real test case for ecosystem services, which is a very uh, important concept, um, sort of gaining steam through through Europe and is a nice way of uniting um, both sort of positive and, and minus aspects of, of water and things adding to it and things taking away from it and kind of putting those on a level playing field. So if you were to take this... Um, this kind of um, ecosystem services approach, you could you could bring together some of these economic, societal, environmental benefits, um, put them together, and uh, and you could come up with some um, you could pave the way for some nice tools such as um, payments for ecosystem services approaches within this bill. I think. Look forward to your amendments, your draft amendments coming through. Doctor yes, I have a, a number of, of thoughts around Clause 1 of the Bill. In terms of the, the, the amended provision about sustainable use, I think our centre feels that sustainable use is a, a better term than, than what was there before, although we still feel that designed to contribute to is, is maybe quite, uh, quite weak. In terms of, of, of Clause 1 3, I'd agree with Ian that, at, at a minimum, we would think to include social and environmental instead of just other benefit. We do understand that the principal locus for defending the water environment, if you like, is the Water Environment Act. But nonetheless, the focus on development and value, while important, does need to be balanced. So we would see that as a minimum. Another possibility that we suggested is a specific duty to take an ecosystems approach, just as Mark was discussing. Although that still has an anthropocentric element to it, it's still really about human use. And a, a statement that value includes the inherent value of water in its natural environment would be perhaps the, the strongest thing that you could put into this bill. And they are all choices. That, that, that could be made, but certainly some explicit recognition of the social environmental we would see as necessary. I would certainly very much agree with that. I think that um, the focus on economic benefit is clearly important, but increasingly um, we need to better understand the, the social environmental aspects and the area of ecosystem valuation is, is, is developing all the time. 
um, uh, more work has been done to understand uh, what the different types of values are uh, in terms of um, uh, the benefits that can be accrued. And there needs to be that flexibility within the bill to, to, to ensure they're, they're clearly recognised. And that, that developing an ecosystems approach is something which Scotland could also export mm. as, a, yes. as part of its expertise. I think what I failed to, um, to voice properly... A minute ago was the fact that it would, it would be really nice and um, quite an exportable... Um, tangible thing for managing waters and showing how we can do it well in Scotland is if you can use one of these concepts like the ecosystem approach to, to bring water central to a range of other conflicting catchment services such as um, renewable energy, um, growing enough food, um, provision of habitat. So you then say we've, we've got water, we've got competing number of users for water across a, across a wide range of sectors and we need to balance all that um, so that we have enough water for all the, all the particular users and services. I mean, uh, there's one issue, for example, with regards to, to climate change. Um, uh, on the one hand, if we're, we're driving towards an improvement in terms of the quality or uh, the standards for uh, water and, and wastewater, that, that tends to use quite a lot of energy, doesn't it? Um, so how do you balance off the, the, the climate change aspect of improving the standards of your, uh, of your, of your water when you're using, um, a, a, you know, you're, you're putting a, a large energy input into achieving that and uh, uh, you're, car you're missing your carbon targets. How do you, how do you balance that? How do, you, how do you deal with that kind of issue? I mean, it, there's nothing in the bill that would uh, give you guidance on that, is there? Other than perhaps the, the requirement for Scottish water to do more in terms of a, a renewables agenda. I think Scottish water is especially mindful of the, the, the difficulties that, that you talk about. And perhaps as we move into the next regulatory period, we'll see more emphasis on on innovation, or it's the word I try and avoid using, and more emphasis on, I wouldn't say low-tech solutions, but solutions that are, are more cognizant of, of the energy dimension in terms of treatment. Or is that kind of issue to be covered by the, the, this bill? Is, is that right? Um, with the, the, the wider approach, you're not just focusing it narrowly on, on the exploitation of the resource itself. Yeah, there's two sides to that. There are parts that aren't in the bill already, like how you can, um, you can make particular benefits for um, protecting the water environment through minimizing diffuse pollution by also increasing soil carbon um, in, the, in the catchment so that soil erodes less and it stores more carbon. There are complex things like that behind it that aren't in it, but there's also the aspects of um, driving down energy use in water treatment and supply, um, encouraging water reuse, um, being, you know, recovering more resources from what are currently called waste streams. And they're the, the kind of latter group of things are things that are certainly in it. And the Scottish Water is a key player in collaboration, not competition with other SMEs in that um, industry then then the bill has potential to, to balance that side of it, certainly. Um, there's also, you also think um, the, this particular, the water resource can be, uh, can resource use can be linked to land use strategy as well. You think that that's a, a benefit um, that could flow from the bill? Is that, what's your view on that? Certainly that would be good if the two went ahead together. Um, there is currently the Scottish land use strategy that's going ahead and that mentions waters, so any water strategy should necessarily make reference to that um, because that has broader aspects of this kind of habitat and land use for different um, competing aspects which all impact on the water environment quite heavily. Changes to the bill is really what I'm driving at in terms of to, to create these linkages or make sure that these linkages actually happen? I mean, certainly, I think from um, the perspective of the institution of civil engineers, we 
uh, we will recognise that uh, sustainable water management is about much more than uh, uh, managing the assets for, for drinking water separately from doing all these other things. And there's a lot of, as, as you know, there's a lot of uh, progress in integrated catchment management and looking at broadening the boundaries of the way we manage water. And I'm going back to what I was saying earlier about collaboration, ensuring you know, that there is strong collaboration between Scottish Water and its regulators and other stakeholders at a catchment level. Um, each catchment has different challenges and different issues, um, but um, through the river basin planning process and so on, there is an opportunity to uh, develop these more uh, cohesive approaches. And certainly I think the bill could do more to under underscore the importance of, of those kinds of um, catchment-based approaches. Okay, uh, a couple of more specific questions um, um, regarding the directions that Scottish ministers um, uh, might issue in terms of um, the two designated uh, bodies, uh, and they should first be um, subject to a public consultation, or certainly. That was one of the issues that was raised, I think, by uh, your organisation, Dr Hendry. What, can you explain what benefits this would bring, and do you think that the list of designated bodies included in the bill is appropriate? I have no concern about the list of designated bodies as such, or the powers of the ministers to, to add to that list with consultation. Um, I know that some organisations have already asked if they could be designated bodies. I have a general concern about directions in that effectively they have the force of law but they're not always published in quite the same way as a, a legal instrument and that was part of the reason why in, in the centre's response and also its response to the government consultation we suggested that the direction should be consulted on unless of course they're being made in an emergency and there simply is not time to consult and that, that's different and that, it, uh, that that should be a public consultation, and that there should be a commitment to, to publish the directives. They are usually available directions somewhere, but they're not always easy to find. So I think it was a general transparency issue around the use of directions. Anyone else got a view on that subject? Uh, they seem like an, an appropriate, the, the ones mentioned seem an appropriate group to bring together to try and resolve some of the issues, um, funding new innovation, um, putting together regulation with perhaps regulatory barriers that would stand in the way of some of that innovation being realised. Scottish Water in its unique position to, to kind of lead and, and flagship some of that development. Um, SEPA, SNH Enterprise, that, that seems good. I mean, there, there was one, there's one particular body, perhaps forestry, the forestry sector that isn't represented there, that's quite a big landowner, especially mm -hmm. in protected source regions. Yeah, I would uh, echo what, uh, what Sarah said about um, consultation. Particularly, I think it's important to consult the other designated bodies um, before directing um, one of them. Uh, because uh, for all... <laughs> well, the, the government doesn't know everything, uh, so there's, there's always something that can be learnt from consultation. Um, and when, when there's no urgency, then uh, um, I, I don't really see what the, what the objection to consultation could be. Um, now, uh, one other issue that uh, witnesses have um, suggested uh, that we make changes to is that um, there's a proposed reporting period of three years, um, and some people say that's too short. Others uh, have welcomed it on the basis that it would potentially fit with the, the six-year reporting cycle uh, for river basin management plans. Do you have a, a view on the adequacy of the three-year reporting, and you know what what should be the content of that of that report? What are your views? From our perspective, we were concerned that actually three years was too long to wait to report. Um, if, you know, given that the hydrogenation agenda is important for Scotland and, and, pr and making progress uh, towards its objectives, we thought that certainly initially 
um, consideration should be given to uh, a, more, uh, a more frequent reporting, perhaps um, you know, to establish momentum and ensure that progress is being made and that there's good return on the investment that's being made. Um, and of course, that could be uh, reviewed in the future. One of the things we'd like to have clarified is that this will be ongoing reporting because on one reading of that clause it's a single report after three years or, or thereabouts. Also we noted that in this bill there's a provision to repeal the reporting, the high level reporting mechanism for the Water Environment Water Services Act. So we would like to see ongoing reporting and the, the, the periodicity of it is perhaps less important. And we wonder if perhaps there's an opportunity to, to coalesce because they're still reporting under the Floods Act and then the reporting under rules which is being taken away. There might be a, a, a rationale by having a single high-level reporting on the policy and legislative framework for the management of water that could incorporate all three of these, perhaps. Uh, the hydrogenation agenda certainly is building uh, ahead of steam over the last few months. Um, it would be nice to keep that momentum going. So with, with that in mind, three years is a long way away um, to understand at that point and then the analysis after that um, as to whether we're doing something correctly or not um, when hydrogenation is something that's, that's so important. I mean, for example, to in kind of realising new flows of money into into Scotland from from Europe in research and design aspects with the, the Europe's kind of the framework EU funding into, into science and innovation around their horizon 2020. Um, hydrogenation is, is a good way for us to kind of align to those funds and if we were doing that wrong there's a there's a, a big consequence down the line. So I'd like to see reporting done in stages a bit earlier if possible. I, I, I think it's uh, perhaps wrong to repeal the, uh, the reporting duty on ministers um, under the uh, um, Water Environment and Water Services Act. Uh, the, the River Basin Management Plan is a six yearly detailed reporting requirement um, uh, at a very detailed level. Uh, I, so I think that has, serves quite a different purpose than the, than the purpose of a uh, uh, section 26 of, of the Water Act, um, which is a, a high-level report to Parliament annually. So I, th I, th I don't think they serve the same purpose. It would be nice if, uh, as, as has just been pointed out, that um, this could be reviewed in line with all the other um, statutory instruments as well as uh, other aspects, tools, to realising some of these water benefits to make sure things are on track and not to do it in isolation. That would certainly be beneficial. The only other related matter that we certainly would be interested to see something on was what type of reporting we're talking about. Are, are there particular measures that should be developed um, and uh, aligned with, you know, obviously, the objective uh, of, of, the, of the Hydro Nation agenda and that could be reported across the different aspects we've been discussing, whether it's to do with direct economic benefit or whether it's to do with other aspects, such as improvements in employment, education, um, uh, and, and knowledge, knowledge development transfer, for instance, and, and to ensure that the reporting system adequately covers the, the aspirations of the overall agenda. Sure, we will. Um... We move on to water abstraction now. Alex, you've got some questions on this. Thank you very much. Yes, abstraction, the surprise package within the proposals. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of you have already indicated substantial concerns about the underlying purpose and even the need uh, for this section of the bill. Uh, could you explain that and tell us how you might have preferred to see this dealt with within the bill? And Ukela's as well, to, and possibly even more so, is that there are already a very comprehensive set of abstraction controls applying in Scotland under the controlled activities regulations. And we were struggling to see the added benefit that this provision gives. I know that there's an argument that the ministers are better placed to consider economic and social aspects, and that, that's perhaps something that the Ukela response discussed more, more fully. But 
we saw no reason in principle why the ministers would not exercise their calling powers over abstractions of certain types and above certain limits, for example. The car regime is quite well established now. It works very well. It's very thorough. It has good provisions for third-party representation and so forth. So we were finding it difficult to see exactly what the added benefit of another layer of regulation would be. It, oh, sorry, did this? <laughs> it's late inclusion uh, means it wasn't consulted upon. Do you think there's some merit in the government entering into a consultation on this prior to the final stages of the Bill in Parliament? I, I don't think I could answer that. I mean, clearly there's a consultation going on now through the Parliamentary Committee and at this stage that might be the best way. I imagine there would be time constraints that, that might impact on that. You should never overestimate the ability of a committee to influence the government. Well, no, no, that's, that's exactly what I meant. The committee is taking this forward and that's perhaps a, a, a better place for that discussion at this stage. Um, mm. Anybody else have views on that? Well, my, my point was around the... Um, how the the 10 megalitres per day is it the, anyway the um the defined limit um at which it should um be called upon in ministerial um deliberation on it was defined it, it seems rather arbitrary and, and if obviously that abstraction rate should be matched to the size of the water body or the other services which are receiving damage or losses because of the water is being abstracted um so it can't necessarily be applied uh, across the board as a single uh, value. So unless that is dealt, if that's dealt with in car already, then that, that would probably suffice that aspect. But if it's not, then you need something that looks a bit more um, specifically about where it's been taken from rather than a standard amount. Uh, I would certainly very much agree with that. I mean, I, we appreciate that you'd want some kind of limit for practical purposes, but you know, every, every catchment is, is different. I mean, the other thing for us was a little bit more understanding of the reasons for the particular exemptions that were identified. There seemed to be a wide number of exemptions to this new new power, um, and it wasn't clear to us, you know, why some of these activities would be considered differently uh, to to uh, other more general abstractions. Mm. That's uh, was really my next question: was to ask uh, both yourself and. Uh, Mr. Stutter, the, about the concerns you've expressed about the regime and the, the way that certain um, individuals will, or certain activities will be exempted? Um, well, there are obviously a range of activities who are, are taking water and some, uh, I think it's been discussed before in the, in the previous um, evidence given that, that some uh, users of that, abstractors of that water will return it virtually unpolluted um, so they're just a temporary borrower of it, if you like. Um, some may return it heated up, or some may return it polluted, or some may evaporate it off to the sky. So there's, there's lots of different things in that, and, uh, and whether that's dealt with successfully by um, a kind of older system like an abstraction licence, or whether it is time now to look more at sort of the quality of what's being returned and look to sort of consumption-based, you know, usage-based... Um, financial schemes well, that's getting a bit more into the sort of payment for ecosystem services side but it's something that you this bill could touch on and, and you know make a, a new really fit for purpose uh, scheme work mm -hmm. um, I, I would agree with that I, I think the, the the control activities regulation or the, the charging scheme does that CEPA operates covers these nuances of about um, consumptive uses and non-consumptive uses of, of the water resource. And the regulations themselves, uh, although it's not clear on the face of the regulations because of the way they're, they're, um, they've been drafted, uh, um, this, this goes back to the purpose of the, the new regime, or the proposed regime. Um, the, re the, the controlled activities regulations uh, are required to implement the provisions of the Water Framework Directive, as you know. Um, and one of the provisions of the Framework Directive is that when uh, um, uh, an abstraction would cause a deterioration in status, uh, ecological status of the water body, in other words, if there was such a big abstraction that it, that it downgraded the status of the water body, um, SIPA has to conduct a, 
a major balancing exercise based on sustainable development principles. So it, um, it's therefore required to consider economic and social aspects as well as purely environmental aspects. So, so the, the SEPA process, SEPA has a very well um, uh, and uh, uh, um, de well, a well-developed uh, method for dealing with these decisions and it applies it um, quite frequently. It's also been successfully defended on appeal, so it's been subject to scrutiny by Scottish government reporters. Um, so uh, it, it's not, in fact, accurate to say that uh, SIPA only looks at the environmental aspects uh, for major abstractions. Um, so I, I, I particularly on that, on that ground question the, the, the need for the regime. I do actually have some data on the numbers of uh, authorised abstractions under the controlled activities regulations around the 10 megalitre threshold if you're interested. Um, the, the data that SEPA gave me excluded public water supply uh, because of concerns about, uh, well, I'll let them explain that if they want to. Uh, uh, but uh, apart from, well, public water supply would be exempt under the proposals anyway. Um, but there are currently 199 authorised abstractions exceeding 10 megalitres per day, uh, of which 177 would be exempt under, the, under these proposals. So, uh, and the remaining 22 are um, uh, for industrial process, pro process water, whether that's for cooling um, or for, for other, other industrial uses, it's not clear from the data I've received. Um, and below that threshold, there's um, between two and 10,000 megalitres per day, um, there are 100. So there's actually more in the, in the, in the higher category than there are in, the, in the, uh, the middle category. So you'd be, under the current proposals, we'd be looking at maybe 20 abstractions over, um, over five years since uh, CAR came into force. On a slightly different tack, uh, I think it was the Centre for Water Law that raised the issue of the ownership of water and the possible bulk sales of water out with Scotland. Can you explain uh, or expand on these comments and tell us how this might impact on the proposals in the Bill? Well, I think the committees already have evidence from Stephen Rees, and you asked him about ownership, and I, I would generally agree with, with everything that he said. I think in terms of the historic analysis of who owns water in a, in a mixed jurisdiction like Scotland, it's very complex. We have our roots in Roman law. We go back to Roman law. It was very complex there as well. I think we would generally say that there is no ownership as such, at least in running water but that there are property rights that might amount to or look quite like some elements of ownership in terms of, of the degree of use that can be afforded. I think that uh, when we brought in the, the Water Environment Act and the Controlled Activities Regulations, and those were not challenged in terms of prior ownership rights in water, and I think that's really heartening, it indicates that users in Scotland are, are cognizant of the need for a modern water law regime that allocates water on a, a sensible licensing system. So ownership is not really an issue, I think, at the moment in terms of the, the policy and legislative framework. And to be honest, I'm not convinced that bulk water supply is either, at least not in, in the sense of major transfers for public use. There are environmental, but also engineering issues around bulk transfer of water. But what I would say is that in the centre's understanding, in many places around the world where bulk transfers out of a jurisdiction have been attempted, that then triggers a lot of public concern, a lot of NGO concern. And at that point, these questions around ownership might become more, more lively, let's say. So I think we were just drawing attention to the fact that the position is not wholly clear. It's in many ways been overtaken by the modern statutory framework that we have now, but that there might still be issues there that, that might arise, particularly in the context of, of bulk supply. Mm 
So can you not imagine uh, circumstances during the projected lifetime of this legislation where uh, it would be found inadequate if it didn't deal with these issues? Whether the bill should deal with ownership? Well, when I'm, uh, when I'm in other countries, mm -hmm. I tend to take the view that the best thing for a Water Resources Act or a Water Code to provide is that water is held in public trust. And I think that's an answer to the ownership question, which is generally unobjectionable and, and, and hits all the right notes in that the, the state has control over it in, in the public interest and can allocate it for beneficial uses and so forth. So that, that would be my, my preference in terms of, of framing a, a model water act. On the other hand, I don't think when Woos went through that it was really an issue that, that had to be addressed and so perhaps sensibly it wasn't. But that's how I would deal with it um, in terms of a, a general sort of approach. Yeah, I, I would uh, support that. And I think there, is a, there may be an opportunity with this legislation to, to clarify that issue, um, which isn't, as Sarah says, it isn't clear. Um, it would chime with Scottish Water's particular status in Scotland, uh, you know, perhaps in in contrast to the situation in England, where Scottish Water is our only public water company. Um, so I, th I think there is an opportunity. And just to go back to your previous point, I do think uh, uh, it would be a good idea to consult, for the, for the government to consult on, on this proposal uh, about, the, particularly the new abstraction regime. I think it deserves wider uh, scrutiny, if you like. that you're not regarded as a, a water owner but custodian maybe yeah. and you could say that you you had to then act in in the ways that minimized its pollution or waste or something you never had ownership but you were responsible for it whilst it was on your land or something thank you okay if we move on to uh, scottish waters uh, functions uh, specifically. Um, through its horizons arm, Scottish Water is already investing in renewable energy sources and waste management activities. So do you think that this part of the bill is really necessary? Sarah, do you want to give it? Yeah, I think it adds a, a deal of clarity and makes some provision that wasn't there before. So obviously the specific requirements around developing the assets and developing renewables, that, that gives a, uh, these are things that Scottish Water is doing anyway, but it makes it clear perhaps that those are part of the hydronation agenda. I think also we have a, a new definition of core functions and we go back to the 2002 Act and Section 70 read with Section 25. It's not wholly clear. They're not the easiest provisions to read. So I think Clause 24 here is certainly an improvement in that it specifies for the first time that this is water and sewerage services. Uh, but, think, but does that represent an expansion then of their core functions, do you think? Well, we've been reflecting a lot on this. I think, I think our concern was, was around this, this phrase relating to. And perhaps it's more something for the, the policy context rather than the bill itself. But what, what is relating to water and sewerage services? And if we think about renewables, if Scottish Water is generating renewable energy on site for use in a treatment facility, then that's clearly relating to water and sewerage provision and something that's core business and, and regulated and, and paid for by, by the customers. If they are generating energy that, that is solely going to the grid through Scottish uh, Water Horizons, that, that's on the other side. But there, there could be grey gray areas here where it's harder to draw the line where some energy is used in-house, some is being exported. So I think there is a need for a lot of clarity around what is regulated business and what is Scottish Water Horizons business. And, and that's all we're looking for. OK. Um, the... In your evidence, the James Hutton Institute um, said that uh, there was a need for localism in distribution, water reuse, waste stream separation and treatment. Um, could you maybe expand on that a bit and how it relates to the proposals in the bill? 
Yeah, um, there's lots of innovation needed in the water sector to uh, overcome the kind of status quo that we have at the moment of um, the inherited systems of distribution, um, especially in a, a fragmented population country like Scotland, um, and our treatment of uh, what are currently viewed as wastes, rather wastefully, in fact. Um, but in order to, to do that, uh, requires infrastructural change on quite large uh, scales. So the fact that we have Scottish Water in uh, as a public body, really, that is able to act outside of the, um, the kind of constraints of shareholders and things does put Scotland and Hydro Nation as in quite an enviable position, um, certainly across Europe anyway, to my knowledge. So if we can economise on that um, and they can with the support as well of this bill, make some slightly brave steps towards putting some of that infrastructure in place so that we can um, perhaps do things a bit more innovatively in the future, separate wastes uh, locally so they're not being you know, domestic waste mixed with industrial waste and uh, the resource potential reuse um, is lost because it's contaminated. If we can, if we can get them to act a bit more innovatively and use some of these local <coughs> solutions, local water distribution treatment, um, drive the energy down and use that as a model which is then uh, an exportable commodity of kind of how, how Scotland is doing things a bit more revolutionary. And that's that's how I, I saw sort of Scottish Water's role in um, in the hydro, you know, its pillar in hydronation and sort of contributing to that innovation. Okay, and um, you'll know that there have been some concerns raised by the energy and waste management sectors that granting uh, that the granting of these powers to Scottish Water will give it uh, and its subsidiaries an unfairly an unfair competitive advantage uh, in the market. Is that something that concerns you, or is it a reality? Uh, yes, you wouldn't want to skew the marketplace for, for small companies who are trying to act on their own footing, but you'd have to instead come up with something that um, Scottish Water was seen as a, as a big player in hydronation, along with the academic part of the R&D sector. And then if you, you had those two, Scottish Water Academics coming, and the hydronation, Scottish Government coming together as, a, as an enabling body, and then Scottish Water was carefully positioned so it didn't act in competition with the SMEs, it was like a collaborator enabler, then hopefully that would resolve that. But yeah, I could, it's quite important to, to resolve that, obviously. I mean, any view on that? I mean, I think on, on the sort of flip side, I think one of the fundamental things to be encouraged as far as Scottish Water is concerned is, is this whole concept of resource efficiency. So whether it's... Um, generating energy that allows it to reduce, helps it to reduce its energy use, whether it's making best use of, 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 of the byproducts of the treatment and, and, uh, and, and the maximising the recovery of, of resources. I think um, that should all be very, very much in, in, encouraged and that again could be used as an exemplar for, for other organisations, other water companies, but also other, other, other processing um, or, you know, organisations that process inputs and produce outputs uh, and to, to move away from, from the concept of, well, we're producing this service of, of water and sewage and we're not really worried about everything else. Fundamentally, what we should be moving towards is the maximum efficient use of resources um, through the operations that an organisation performs. Hey, Gordon. Yeah, apart from the bill allows Scottish Water to enter into agreements with landowners in order to undertake works to prevent the deterioration of water quality. Concerns have been raised about the nature of these agreements and that some clarification is required. In evidence from the Centre for uh, Water Law and UKILA, the asset linkages between the proposals in Part 4 of the bill and existing regulation of raw water quality under the Water Environment and Water Services Act and the Water Framework Directive are made more explicit. How could this be achieved? Well, 
I mean, we support FART4, FART first of all. We think there's a great deal that water services providers, when they're vertically integrated, could and should be doing in terms of, of catchment protection at that scale. We know that the diffuse pollution regulations have been brought in and are being enforced by SEPA. We understand that SEPA's monitoring of water quality has been reducing for various reasons. So I think what we were concerned about was firstly to make sure that there was adequate tying in of the, the two sets of activities. Certainly this is things Scottish Water should be doing. We did suggest possibly a, a specific duty to cooperate with SEPA in terms of their process and perhaps a wider duty of cooperation as we see in the Floods Act to make sure that Scottish Water is working with all of the key stakeholders when it's taking forward their catchment initiatives. We would be concerned to, to make sure, as I'm sure will be the case, that nobody was incentivising a land manager to do something that the, the criminal law required them to do anyway. It's really around that. Sarah's covered it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yes. This uh, area of kind of linking the, the catchment <coughs> water source with the, the water itself, um, this is quite, quite key. Um, it brings in all those things we talked about earlier about water as a limiting factor for developing other assets, renewable energy, ex food, etc. So within the, within the bill, as it's written, um, this is quite vague, in fact. Um, so there's such text as to enter Scottish water, to enter into agreements um, with owners and occupiers of land, as well as local authorities carrying out activities. So writing things such as agreements and activities is, is fairly vague when in other places in the bill, there are very specific bits of text, such as the fats down um, down sewerage network. So it, it seems that you, whether that's been necessarily left vague for a purpose, but it's clearly an important area because Scottish Water are undertaking catchment based solutions to um, some of their source water problems, for example, the pesticides in the Yugi. Um, CPA and their priority catchments obviously know that's important and it kind of wraps up all the, all the catchment aspects, such as the water blueprint it's trying to do. So it is a big area and one that is very important. We touched upon SEPA, and in some of the evidence we've received, it's been argued that SEPA would be a better organisation to take on the new powers regarding raw water quality rather than Scottish water. Can you explain any reasoning behind this statement, why you think SEPA would be better? I think it was from the Centre for Water Law in Ukela mentioned it. Point that SEPA has traditionally had the expertise in terms of monitoring raw water quality and seeking to manage diffuse pollution. And the diffuse pollution regulations in Scotland were quite innovative. Very few countries have gone down that particular route and they haven't had a great deal of time to, to really become embedded. But we do recognise that the, the water services provider can play a key role here as well. And we do understand that there might be certain situations where they are in a better position to come to an agreement with the land manager than the regulator might be. So and we're not suggesting that Scottish Water shouldn't be doing these things, but we do think it's important that they cooperate closely, especially with SEPA and with other authorities. SEPA are certainly um, the, the best uh, regulatory body for monitoring, undertaking the monitoring to, to see whether the water is fit for purpose or not. But until quite recently with their kind of excellent approach to general binding rules, they weren't always people that uh, made things happen on the ground, let's say. So uh, they're doing the priority catchment um, actions at the moment. But that's quite recent, and there should be more of that. But there are other people who can do more of that. Scottish Water is obviously are trying to do it in its own way now, and that appears very successful. But there are other um, bodies, such as catchment management partnerships, that exist in Scotland that include SEPA alongside other people, including your designated bodies and wider, uh, who are very good models for doing that at the moment. I think it's important for the committee to understand, if you don't already, that uh, the uh, regulation, the, the, the diffuse pollution regulations as part of CAR are, um, involve no contact between individual operators and SEPA. Uh, the general binding rules are observed in their breach, if you like, uh, only. Uh, so, so there's only you're authorised if you if you comply with the rules, basically. 
Uh, so there's no there's no existing contact with CEPA. So it's important, therefore, that a partnership approach uh, and, and it is used between public bodies and that public bodies share their resources in carrying out, in trying to enforce the regulations because uh, it would be an enormous task. And that's why it has to be done on a priority basis, as, as Mark has said. But uh, it'd, be a, it'd be a long time before CEPA, for Scotland can say that uh, we know that we've dealt with a diffuse pollution issue. And what it took for that to work on, on CEPA's part was uh, when it started, I mean, the, the general binding rules were um, poorly um, understood amongst the farming community particularly, and it took uh, CEPA's uh, wise actions in um, communicating a uh, national campaign of those and then undergoing demonstrations and, and actual catchment walks before um, the message really sunk in. So it's that kind of uh, enabling local on the ground coordination that perhaps the bill could further. Yeah, thanks very much. <coughs> yeah, um, we'll talk, I want to ask you some questions about septic tanks, um, if you don't mind. Um, at the moment, the bill is allowing, well, the new bill going through will allow um, an individual to take action um, if there's two, three or four other, or, uh, other uh, individuals sharing that septic tank. Um, but it will rely on one person taking sort of action to actually get the septic tank sorted, pay up front and then try to recover the cost from the other owners, um, which could probably end possibly in court action. I mean, how do, you th how do you feel, how effective will this provision within the bill be ensuring the maintenance of the septic tanks um, and taking into consideration that some of the owners who won't want to pay for the maintenance? And do you think there's any other ways that such situations could be tackled? I think this is a huge improvement on the existing situation uh, because um, e even where you have got a situation where there is one or more willing householders who, who want to take action, who know there's a problem and are willing to do something about it, they are stuck. So uh, this, this at least improves the situation to that extent so that uh, one willing owner can, if necessary, through legal action, uh, you know, force force their fellow owners to, to help them do it. So uh, it's not ideal, but uh, it's a big step forward. Um, of course, SEPA, SEPA itself has powers to uh, deal with problem septic tanks, but uh, when it comes to enforcement, there's a similar issue, to, you know, when you've got groups of householders sharing a a single septic tank, it's difficult to attribute blame uh, um, in, a, in an even-handed way, if you like. Um, so, uh, but, but at least, you know, well, the other thing is that SEPA doesn't yet know where all the septic tanks in Scotland are because uh, the register's not yet complete um, because of the pragmatic approach that SEPA adopted to the implementation of, of CAR in in the first couple of years. Uh, but one of the things which brings a septic tank to SEPA's attention is when there's a problem. Uh, and then people will complain and then uh, registration happens and then action occurs. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I would support the measure. I, I, I can't think of a, another way, you know, can't think of how to deal with a situation where there isn't a willing owner. Uh, unfortunately, that's, that's still a problem. Um, unless unless CEPA can you know unless CEPA comes in uh, and inevitably enforcement is quite a kind of heavy-handed approach or, or can be a heavy-handed approach so it's maybe there's nothing maybe there's no middle way. I mean, we did suggest the possibility of Scottish Water having a, a, a budget and being more proactive in taking over septic tanks in rural areas. 
and I appreciate that there is a sense that that might interfere with individuals' property rights. I think in, in many cases, if one is unlucky enough to be part owner of a malfunctioning septic tank, that would probably be quite welcome. There would certainly be a cost involved. You, you might say that was equitable and that those of us lucky enough to live in the middle of Scotland get part of our mains drainage funded by Scottish Water. You might say it's, it's too high a cost. So we accept that that's not what's come forward in the bill. And given the complexity, I, I tend to agree with you, and this, is, this will solve the most common situation where there is perhaps one recalcitrant owner, but where there's a whole group of them and, and you're expecting just one person to, to find the funds, that it won't solve that. We would also support the, the provision in the UKLA response that if this part of the bill goes forward, that there should be standard forms for people to use in, in schedules to the bill. We think that would be really helpful to owners in this situation. Do you, oh, sorry, you go. I was just going to say that multiple occupancy septic tanks are, are obviously the next level down after water treatment works to be able to kind of regulate or tackle the regulation of us as point sources rather than the very much more diffuse individual tanks in the rural environments. Uh, and it's probably there worth uh, a little resource spend in being directed towards ascertaining whether the tanks are failing um, because you can mm -hmm. probably get a a better um, benefit for your for your money um, by tackling those rather than, than trying to put money into um, into the individual householder tanks. There are um, barriers in some of the eco innovation um, aspects of of tidying up some of these effluents, such as uh, some of the willow biomass treatment bed things like that, um, where even if the water is taken to quite a a, a very clean state by some of these tertiary treatments. Um, the rules say that it still can't be discharged. It would need to be piped away or something. So that they're in the, in the bigger multiple occupancy one. So there are still some policy regulation clashes there and it would be a sensible place to target some actions to resolving the issues. Uh, just added on to that, I'm sort of, I don't and have never actually had a septic tank. so. Um, I don't know what the, the repair costs could actually be, but I'm thinking from a homeowner's point of view, if you out of four people were only the one person willing to actually pay up front to actually get the septic tank repaired, there could be a large bill involved, and it may involve maybe somebody actually having to take out a personal loan to actually pay for it. Um, knowing that then they're going to have court costs on top. I mean, with that in mind, do you think there would be a lot of people actually then going to be proactive in, in getting the septic tank repaired? I, think I have got a septic tank. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I did have to get repairs done last year. Uh, not, not to the tank itself. I don't share the tank, but I share the, the soak away, which is where the the effluent from the tank is dissipated into the into the ground. Uh, that's the that's effectively the discharge point into the ground or groundwater, if you if you like, um, and that cost two thousand pounds between three households to effectively dig up and replace the whole soak, soak away, which was malfunctioning. Um, so yes, I think there would be concerns about uh, um, getting uh, disadvantaged householders to, to fork up. Um, yeah. And always coupling the tank to its effluent outflow field is quite important when you've come to the, the specifics of the text because often people will say the tank when it's actually uh, that's about a third of the treatment or perhaps a quarter and most of it is by the filtration through the soil in the outflow field and uh, you know in a lot of cases that's actually directly piped to a to a stream mm -hmm. when there's no effective kind of treatment through the soil thank you um my last question is about water shortage. Um, the sort of written evidence is generally supportive of the proposed water shortage orders. Do you have any concerns about these new orders in particular? May they might have impact neg negatively upon businesses relying on water use? 
there are two ways in which a business might be affected. One is through the water savings measures in Schedule 2, whether, whether they're being recommended as a preliminary stage before an order or accompanying an order. And I suppose the other is in terms of businesses whose abstraction rights are affected by the new controls brought in. And I don't think there's much you can do about that to think if you're going to bring in a water shortage order that allows perhaps Scottish Water to make additional abstractions and, and other people will have to have a reduction in what they can abstract, then that, that is a consequence of the nature of the order. In terms of the water saving measures, we argued at the, the second government consultation very strongly that these should apply to businesses as well as households in the first place. And I think that that is the case. Now, I, I saw the evidence, I think Consumer Focus Scotland suggested that that could maybe be a bit clearer yet because it refers to people. So I think it's important, in fact, on, on equitable grounds that the, the measures do apply um, to both domestic and commercial users. And I think that's 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 the right balance that's been struck in part seven now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, anyone else got any further questions? Well, thank you very much, um, folks, for that. It was uh, very helpful in our consideration of the bill. And could I ask you just to leave quietly and quickly, and we'll crack on with the rest of our um, our agenda this morning. Um, if we can move swiftly on to agenda item three, because time is marching on. Uh, subordinate legislation um, committee is now invited to consider an instrument of subordinate legislation subject to the negative procedure, namely the work, Road Works Inspection Fees Scotland Amendment Regulations 2012. Um, you've got paper five and the accompanying instrument. There have been no motions to annul. Uh, have been received in relation to this instrument. Does anybody have any comments? Alex? Very briefly, uh, I, I didn't see it in the notes anywhere, but I presume that this is just a, a rise to take care of inflation. I notice in uh, paragraph two uh, in the instrument, such as it is, uh, there's a, a C marked in the footnote, which appears to indicate that there have been regular rises on an annual basis. I presume that was increases in the fee at previous time to take care of inflation. Yeah, I think yeah. so. So in that case, you know, a one pound rise and thirty two pounds is inflation rounded up in my view, so I've no problem <laughs> with that. Okay. Uh, is the committee agreed that it doesn't wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? Yep, that is agreed, thank you. Um, agenda item four is European Union issues. Uh, the committee will now review its EU priorities and a report on its EU engagement activity in 11-12. Uh, Members will recall that we agreed our list of EU priorities earlier this year and that they were debated in the Chamber along with the priorities of other committees. Paper 6 includes two annexes that have been prepared by the committee's former EU reporter uh, Aileen MacLeod. Um, I'd like to thank Aileen for her work throughout her time as an EU reporter which has given her background in Europe, has been absolutely invaluable. The paper provides a useful handover to the next EU reporter who will be appointed at our next meeting. So the committee is invited to note Aileen's update on each of our EU priorities, which is in Annex A. Do any members have any comments to make on that part of the paper? Members content to note the update report? Yep. Okay. Um, Annex B is a report on the committee's EU engagement over the past year. The European Committee has asked all committees to submit a report on their EU activities, and these reports will be considered by the European Committee as part of its review of the first year of the Parliament's EU strategy. So, are members content to note the report and agree to submit it to the European Committee for its consideration? That is agreed. Okay, I that can now close uh, this meeting. That's the end of our business for today. Our next meeting is the 31st of October when we'll continue our scrutiny on the Water Resources Bill. Okay, close the meeting. Thank, Thank you. you.